digital transformation case study in the travel industry, zero trust, generative AI, and the legal implications of chat GPT. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover here today in episode number 117 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberling. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling, the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of transformation success. And with me, as always, is Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Thanks for being here today. This is Transformation Ground Control, the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people process, strategy, aspects of change. We have new episodes every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as on audio podcast platforms such as Amazon, Apple Podcasts, Google, et cetera. So be sure to check us out every week. Great episode for you here today. We've got uh, some opening questions we're going to get to, questions from the audience on social media. Uh, that's a new segment that we started a few weeks ago where we capture questions that people ask me on social media and we answer them here in real time on this podcast. And then after the Q&A session, we're going to get into a couple of hot topics in the digital transformation space. One is a case study of digital transformation in the travel industry. And then we're also going to talk about zero trust as well as generative AI, um, two of the tech trends and predictions for 2023. And we're going to relate that to a specific article that Kyler has for us here today. <clears throat> Excuse me, but we're going to focus on those two topics within those predictions to begin. And then later in the show, we'll have our first guest, who's Marcus Harris, a repeat guest. I'd, I'd say he's probably the guest that's been on the most times, I would think by this point, um, four or five times, maybe in the last two years that we've been doing this podcast, he is going to be on talking about a really cool topic. I think it's very cool, but I'm, I'm extremely biased on this, but uh, we're going to talk about chat GPT, but we're not going to just talk about the unicorns and rainbows part of chat GPT and how great it is and how cool it is and how it's going to totally change our lives and make everything perfect in the future. Instead, we're going to talk about some of the dark side of chat GPT. So we're going to focus on some of the legal implications as it relates to intellectual property, confidentiality, um, the, the truth behind what information you might get out of ChatGPT and other open AI models. So we're going to chat about that and, and get an attorney's perspective of the things that we should be thinking about and aware of as we look to ChatGPT to disrupt our lives uh, day to day. And then later in the show, Kyler and I are going to have a discussion about five years of lessons that we've gathered over the last five years of being in business as a company. Uh, we recently celebrated our five-year anniversary as a company, and we wanted to consolidate and summarize some of those lessons and takeaways that we have from having helped hundreds of clients in those five years uh, through their digital transformation journey. So we're going to summarize some of those lessons learned and, and whatnot during that segment later in the show. So be sure to stay tuned for that. But before we get to our guests here today, what are some of the uh, audience questions you have to start us off with, Kyler? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, we have a lot of great questions in our question jar. Um, obviously, there was a toddler involved in the question jar because there is a big red golf ball in there. So, just is there a, a question size. on the golf ball, or is that just? There I for... hope not. You know, I I don't know much about golf, so let's just we'll just use it as like a little spinny toy. So, I would love to see what question your toddler, your your daughter or son might have uh, put on there for me. But we'll we'll see if you draw it or not. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean, that would be something that the questions they ask me, sometimes I'm like, how do I, how do I really unpack that? Um, yesterday, you asked me if air is, has a taste. And I'm like, I don't know. Because then you start like thinking, does air have a taste? You don't, you don't really know. Maybe <laughs> some people, but so toddler, toddler minds are always interesting, but. Gets you back just, to the basics. 
I know, right? Just as a reminder for um, Eric's question jar, we actually take all of the questions from social media, from um, any platform in which you might follow him on, from different questions that we have on our live streams, all those types of things. So if you drop them in the comments wherever you're watching today, or if you go head over to his YouTube channel and check out some of his new videos that he puts out each week, uh, I will pull those questions and we will ask him in real time. So this is a good question. Um, can you explain the difference between a CIO and a CTO in your perspective? Oh, I actually saw that question on social media and I thought that's a really good question that I don't have a solid, solid answer for. Oh, good. I'm glad I the, picked it. <laughs> <laughs> so you bit me to the punch on that because I did think about, you know, maybe I do a YouTube video on that, but uh, yeah. I hadn't gotten there yet. So once again, you're one step ahead of me, Kyler. And so is this person who asked the question. Right. Um, generally speaking, I'd say that CIO is oftentimes a little bit more uh, holistic, I guess I'd say, in terms of their purview of what they manage and are responsible for within an organization. So typically a CIO is going to be responsible for both maintaining these legacy systems and uh, making sure that you're making incremental improvements to whatever systems you're currently using. They may or may not be heavily involved, they typically are heavily involved in any sort of digital transformation or any sort of more material change or transition of business processes and technologies. Whereas generally speaking, a chief technology officer is oftentimes more focused on sort of that future state visioning and execution of that vision of, of more, um, not disruptive technologies, but more material changes to the technologies. There's a lot of overlap, obviously, between CIO and CTO, but, but CIO, I found is more of a, I don't want to say just day to day, but they have a heavier focus on day to day maintenance and sort of breaking stuff that fix or fixing stuff that's broken. And uh, certainly if a transformation happens, um, they're involved with that as well, whereas a CTO is often more focused on that. Now, that's just speaking from a, a non-tech organization. So if you're a manufacturing organization, whatever, that's the way it works. If you're a CTO at a software company, that's a lot different. That's more focused on um, sort of the vision of what that technology roadmap is going to look like and the sort of technologies you're going to develop for release to a customer base. So there's sort of like two types of CTOs, um, one being tech focused for a software company and the other one being more broad, you know, that any big non-tech company might have as well. Um, I'd say CTOs are becoming a little more in vogue, you know, CIO, you know, it's, it's been around for a long time, that role, yeah. but CTOs are a little bit newer and more focused on the future state, uh, typically. And some organizations will have both. They might have a CIO and the CTO reports to the CIO, or I've seen cases where you've got a CIO and CTO that report up to the CFO or the CEO. And in those cases where the CIO and CTO are peers, it's generally the, the CIO is more focused on maintaining the current state and CTO ends up becoming a little bit more focused on um, that transition into the future. Yeah, it sounds like it kind of falls into that it depends, you know, on the organization and the needs of the business and those types of different things, um, but definitely a good distinction there. All right, this is another great question. Is it fair to say system modernization is a service offered in digital transformation? It is, yes, I would agree with that. Um, system modernization is one, call it uh, potential angle or potential lens that you can view digital transformation through. Uh, but digital transformation is a little bit more broad than that, or there's more options when you just look at it a more comprehensive digital transformation. It could certainly involve system modernization, um, or it could involve more material business process changes, organizational changes, and more of the true transformation um, side of things. Um, in some ways, it's like slicing hairs, though, to talk about system modernization versus digital transformation. I mm -hmm. personally think you could use those terms interchangeably, or, or just look at, you know, digital strategy, define what your digital strategy is, which may entail system modernization, or it could entail more of a broader uh, transformation as well. So, um, so yeah, I would agree that it's a, a component within digital transformation, but it's not the only component. Exactly. Yeah. Like things like OCM and culture and all of those types of things go yeah. into the full digital transformation campaign. Yeah, absolutely. So, sorry. I'm stuck in the, stuck in the question jar. <laughs> um, should I assume that it is always best to go through pre-implementation planning phases prior to the software search even begins? Hmm. 
Well, I'll give you sort of the utopia answer, and then I'll give you the real world answer based on the realities of organizations. I'd say the, the utopia answer is in a perfect world. Yes, you you would do a lot of those pre-implementation activities, which would entail um, defining your future state processes in a fair amount of detail, defining your future state organization, defining the um, sort of the IT roadmap as far as how you're going to transition out of current systems and into future systems. Um, as well as a PMO governance and all that stuff. You, ideally, well, you would want to do that if you can prior to getting into a selection process because then you have better clarity on what it is you're looking for and what your needs are and how potential technologies could fit within your transformation. But the reality is most organizations or a lot of organizations we work with just don't have that luxury of being able to execute that utopia state because oftentimes you need the software selection phase in order to justify any sort of material investment in the transformation going forward. So a lot of times what happens is organizations will flip that and they'll say, well, let's evaluate our needs, pick the right technologies, get an estimate of what the total cost of ownership would be, put together a business case and ROI analysis. And then from there, you typically will go through like a management and board approval for the, the full project, which would include implementation planning, in which case we typically help our clients at that point um, for however many weeks or months it takes, depending on the organization. Um, so that's sort of the reality is just because the way organizations work, the politics, the budgeting, um, the approval processes, all that stuff leads more companies to do sort of the inverse of that, which is selection first, then implementation planning. But if you know you're going to move forward and there's not doubt, or if you've already gotten approval for a transformation, then I would say the better path is to do more of that planning up front and then go into the selection process, which is then going to speed up things later on. Absolutely. Um, that makes a lot of sense. It's almost like we need kind of a, a perfect timeline and maybe you can do a video. You probably already have a video of it. Perfect implementation timeline and then the reality of a digital transformation timeline um, because a lot of it has to depend on the organization and the approval process. So definitely some some good insight there. I did ask that user to also reach out to you directly because um, they had some additional questions about that timeline. And if you search Eric's YouTube channel, uh, he has a ton of content on that as well. So definitely important to understand because sometimes that's a lot of the reason um, for trouble in a project is because things weren't planned out in that pre-implementation or as we call it phase zero um, right. really important part of the project yeah it's a lot like a <clears throat> blueprint or a architecture diagram or whatever you want to call it of what your future state's going to be and then you start to go look at technologies that fit within that and um, do the other planning that goes along with that Absolutely. Definitely. Really important. Um, and we'd love to hear from the audience here about your thoughts on an implementation timeline or any of the other questions here. Um, we get a lot of great dialogue in the comments, so feel free to drop a comment wherever you're watching today. But I've got a few hot topics we'll get to after the break, um, and we'll jump into your feedback on those as well. Yeah, that sounds great. And we'll, uh, we'll come back and we'll get into a couple of these hot topics related to zero trust and generative AI uh, versus the metaverse or how generative AI has uh, succeeded in the ways that the metaverse has not so far. And then stay tuned beyond that, because later in the show, we'll have Marcus Harris on the show, who's going to get into uh, some of the legal implications and data privacy implications of ChatGPT and other open AI models. So we'll sort of get to that dark side of ChatGPT. And then later in the show, Kyler and I will be back to have a conversation to chat about five years of digital transformation lessons, uh, celebrating third stage's five-year anniversary. So we'll kind of summarize some of the the lessons learned from all the hundreds of transformations we've helped clients with throughout the world. And we'll, we'll try to summarize those in that segment later in the show. So we'll come back to these hot topics here in just a moment, but first we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, 
Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Tyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, as well as streaming on Wednesdays to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can always watch after the fact on those same platforms as well. Um, just go look for either my personal or third stages, uh, re respective social media pages on those platforms. So uh, we, you've got a couple of hot topics for us and uh, things related to digital transformation trends. So what have you got for us, Skylar? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I want to take you through a digital transformation case study that's really interesting and focuses on that interoperability. Um, it's called Intrepid Travel. Um, and they really kind of shifted gears to look at customer service and more streamlined automation in communicating with customers. That was their overall objective. So just to give you kind of some numbers here, they centralized 10 um, different databases across 30 countries, which is a mix of Salesforce service and marketing, as well as some experience cloud, tour operators, um, just kind of a single view dashboard for the customer so they could personalize that service. Um, what happened after they went through this transformation is it really contributed to a high net promoter score. Um, and ratings by customers. And that was their overall goal, was to get those um, NPS scores higher and be able to kind of stand out in the industry. Um, so they took a, what they called a single view of, um, approach. So they utilized the platform to display all of the customer's information in one place, and then travel planning as well as previous in inquiries. So you could kind of look up any trip you you were looking to plan and what you have done in the past. So you had that data um, from a customer service perspective. Um, they also looked at a lot of business management issues that they had. Uh, so they did technology updates that kind of enabled that that 360 degree of productivity before they implemented any new software. So a huge look at that business process mapping and understanding what ex their current state is before they implemented um, the overall technology. So the focus here was a CRM tool, but it showcases the need for that digital approach in an industry that has been moving much more towards a, a digital environment. Um, and so their, their financial goal was hitting $1 billion of revenue by 2025. Um, and the next phase is what they call a headless CMS, um, which I thought was kind of funny. It enables you to store your content just once and be present to customers in a number of different platforms. Uh, so that's kind of their next phase of, of what that looks like. So I wanted to share that interesting case study to kind of look at you know, taking a goal and looking at one piece of the business when you're looking at business process mapping, but ensuring the customer experience is the priority. So interested to hear your reaction to that overall information. Well, I love examples and case studies like that because it, it demonstrates and gives us something to refer to on how an organization can get creative with how they use technology to change their business model, change their customer experience, and really give themselves a competitive advantage. And in today's day and age of commercial off-the-shelf software and, you know, cloud-based systems, SaaS systems, uh, pre-configured solutions, sort of like that generic vanilla one-size-fits-all approach to technology, you kind of have to counter some of that with, with creativity and one-off types of technologies. I'm not saying these are all one-off because you mentioned Salesforce and some other tools that are, that are more commercial, but they're, they're applying technology in a creative and unique way that isn't just your vanilla off-the-shelf software. So I think... It's a good reminder that organizations really need to think about in their digital transformations where they could potentially just use basic vanilla software that other organizations are using in the same way, and then distinguish that from the business processes that are more customer facing or create some sort of competitive advantage that maybe you don't want to use commercial off the shelf software because it waters down your competitive advantage. So that's a big, uh, that's my takeaway from that, from my case study, but super fascinating. And I, I like that example. I always like case studies because they showcase results. And a lot of times that's the biggest kind of missing piece is, is not only establishing and carving out an objective, hey, we want to improve our net, um, our net promoter score. We want to, you know, focus on this revenue growth um, for, you know, forecasting, those types of 
core goals and being able to measure against it so that you can showcase the success of the technology or the success of success of the business transformation. So that's why I always like to look at case studies too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's move into some predictions, um, specifically in this research from its um, it's from Enterprise Technology Research. So they did a 2022 predictions, and now they've come out with their 2023 predictions as well. And there's a few that I really want to go into asking you about um, specifically when it comes to what we can look forward to. Um, and this is actually number four and five on their list that we'll dig into. So number four is um, zero trust moves from hype to reality in 2023 and CISOs provide the proof, not vendor marketing. So basically what they're saying is is that zero trust is moving from a buzzword that kind of was birthed in the pandemic to become a priority strategy within enterprise technology within organizations. And they get this information from a survey that they sent to CISOs to qualify kind of that zero trust adoption as evidence to whether the prediction actually will come true or not. And according to that data, that's something that they've they've really embedded in their operating model um, is that zero trust and that internalization of not only independent and technology agnostic services and consulting services like we do here at Third Stage, but also from a data management and cybersecurity standpoint. Oh, interesting. I, I personally was not aware of the zero trust buzzword or a concept. Which is so within. funny because like if anyone should be aware of it, it should be us, but we, we weren't, yeah, we weren't clued into that one. I mean, I knew cybersecurity and I know cybersecurity is and continues to be a, a massive problem and opportunity for organizations, especially the pandemic, but I just hadn't heard that term zero trust. So that's, that's interesting. And to hear it applied in a new way or sort of evolve beyond its original meaning. Absolutely. Um, and really, this their data said it really comes from the board of directors that are beginning to really understand and kind of redefine as they move from hardware security um, towards kind of software defined security. Obviously, the movement to SaaS and the cloud is huge for that. And then also the hybrid work has been a key driver of understanding how kind of zero trust aligns with hybrid work environments from a technology standpoint, not from mm. an employee culture standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, let's talk about number five, because I know, you know, uh, you plan to have a conversation with Marcus around things like generative AI, specifically chat GPT. Um, so their argument here is that generative AI hits where the metaverse missed. Mm. So um, this data is meaning the first time we saw chat GPT or open AI or those sources, it actually produced data as opposed to producing a concept that the metaverse seemed to be more of. Um, and so they, this survey they sent around open AI, um, suppressing, su surpassing, excuse me, the metaverse is about a 52% positive sentiment score. So there's a lot of, of, of thoughts or perception in the marketplace that that is kind of the new enterprise tech and that metaverse doesn't have the same business case that open AI or something like chat GPT does in an organization. Yeah, I could see, um, that's really interesting. I, I hadn't really put the two together or compared the two in that way, but a couple of thoughts come to mind is that, um, first of all, ChatGPT is, is fascinating to me, not only because of the underlying technology and what it can do, but just the way it's caught on like wildfire, you know, throughout the world in terms of just at the consumer level, um, individuals, not even just organizations, but mostly individuals that are deciding to use and embrace this new technology. Whereas the metaverse has a lot, seems to have a lot higher barriers to entry. It's not quite as, uh, you know, it's not quite as accessible and, and uh, it's a little bit more complicated in my opinion. So I, I can see why. Um, AI models or, or open AI types of, of uh, platforms are catching on so quickly, but it makes me wonder about um, people like Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook who like just named their whole company after Meta, doubled down on Metaverse and like, oops, it, was that a mistake? <laughs> Which I always wondered if it was even before AI came around, but now you really start to wonder, if, you know, does AI sort of take the place that Metaverse could have taken, especially in enterprise situations? Like we've had some conversations on here about how 
organizations are starting to use the metaverse. I know you've brought up hot topics in the past around, you know, some case studies of how uh, larger organizations are using the metaverse to help with design and collaboration and things like that. But do you need the metaverse to do that? Or could, is that something else that generative AI models could, could do? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I have a hypothesis that you probably could do that and probably do it better and faster and easier in an open AI sort of platform, but I guess we'll see over time. So that's super interesting. Yeah. And, and this research actually follows the investment, which I think is interesting, you know, the actual capital behind where are those investors going. You saw a lot of people, like you mentioned, invest all in in the metaverse. However, now it's really shift and investors call AI really recession proof um, and have moved more of their money, specifically Microsoft, as we've seen their recent investments in open AI um, are kind of a showcase of, of where that trend might be shifting. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so many vendors are getting into it now with, uh, obviously, uh, you know, Microsoft, Google, OpenAI itself, you know, as a, as a standalone company, but it's taking investments from some of these other tech companies. Uh, Elon Musk has his own platform that he's investing in. So super interesting to see um, just all the, all the competitors and the different options that are coming along. And it'll be curious to see where things stand when the dust settles. I don't think right now we're close to really knowing who the leading contender or what the mainstream option is going to be. It might be ChatGPT, but based on history and experience, usually the pioneer or the first mover in a disruptive field like this isn't going to be the one that's standing at the end of it all. Usually someone will come along and do things better and faster and uh, in a more sustainable way. So we'll see if that's the case here too. Absolutely. Well, lots of opportunity, but also lots of considerations as you will go into and unpack with with Marcus here. So I know I'm excited for that conversation for sure. Yeah, it should be a great one. And, uh, you know, for all the, for all the talk about ChatGPT and all the hype behind it, um, you know, I guess our, our goal is to not necessarily be a buzzkill or a downer on the whole, the whole thread, but certainly embrace and recognize the opportunities that, um, come along with open AI, ChatGPT, Bard, uh, Dolly, whatever AI platform of choice you want to insert here. But, we want to talk about just some of the the legal implications, the data privacy issues, and really just the dark side of ChatGPT and OpenAI. That's really our goal here, is because our philosophy as a company, and certainly on this podcast, is to look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of any trend or any technology or any approach that you might take. And it's easy to think that something like ChatGPT only has upside, but there's significant downside, and that's what we want to get into. And I thought it'd be great to have a attorney's perspective on that. So we thought we'd have uh, our go-to attorney for stuff like this, who's a software attorney and IP intellectual property attorney, um, Marcus Harris from Tap Law. He's a, a repeat guest on the show. We're going to have him on to talk about all that stuff. Uh, but first, we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter, where it streams every Wednesday. And you can also watch on demand starting on Wednesdays. And you can also find the audio podcast platforms on Google, Amazon, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and every other podcast platform you can imagine where chances are very high that we're there. So be sure to look for Transformation Ground Control there. So I'm excited for our next guest, a repeat guest who almost doesn't need an introduction, but we'll introduce him anyway, since uh, it's been a while since he's been on, or at least a few weeks since he's been on. And in case you haven't seen him before or heard from him before, his name is Marcus Harris, and he's a partner uh, at a law firm called Taft Law here in the United States. 
And uh, he specializes in intellectual property and software related issues. Uh, which is really interesting about his background is he used to work at a couple of different software vendors as their internal legal counsel. And now he's working for a law firm, primarily representing buyers of technology and people that are negotiating with those software vendors. So we thought it'd be great to have him on the show to talk about the dark side of ChatGPT and OpenAI, but more specifically, the legal implications, the confidentiality, intellectual property, data breach sorts of issues that come along with the excitement of ChatGPT and OpenAI. So with all, that, with all that being said, Marcus, welcome to the show. Hey, Eric, it's good to see you again. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on to talk about this. And like you said, I mean, you know, this is an evolving world uh, of really innovation and, and impact. And I think, you know, the legal implications are pretty critical to have an understanding of, especially, I mean, you know, I look at this from two perspectives. One is just from a consumer perspective, wanting to know what the legal implications are um, kind of play out those risks and, and, and look at how, you know, this is going to impact you and what kind of legal constraints there are uh, with respect to, to AI. Um, and then I look at it from an enterprise perspective and figure out, you know, look, what are the benefits? What are the use cases? How do you mitigate risk and how do you exploit this technology to really gain some efficiencies um, in, on the corporate, you know, ERP, big data, big software side? Yeah, absolutely. And it's in, like I said, at the, the intro of this discussion, um, this is such a hot topic right now, and there's so much excitement around it, so much curiosity around it. Um, OpenAI and ChatGPT are things that are mentioned in mass media and pop culture. Um, a recent episode of South Park, which is a which is a, a popular U.S. comedy, animated comedy, even had a whole episode dedicated to ChatGPT. So you, you start to look at these signals that people are really interested in this topic, and so we thought. It'd be kind of cool to talk about, you know, what are, you know, we want to temper some of the enthusiasm about the the technology, not to suggest it's not a good technology. It won't totally transform the way we do business, but we also need to recognize the risks and the, and the potential dark side of ChatGPT, OpenAI. Um, and by the way, I, I'll, I'll keep talking about ChatGPT and OpenAI, but really this whole conversation relates to any, any AI um, model, generative AI that's out there. So Google has their own version of BARD. Uh, Microsoft has a uh, co-pilot, uh, which is something that it's a little bit different, but that they've introduced that as part of their office 365 suite or their, I think they're beta testing it now. Um, and Microsoft is also a investor in open AI. Um, Elon Musk is, is investing in his own platform for, for sort of an open AI, um, type of model. So it's, we're talking about ChatGPT, open AI, but we'll sort of use that as a universal term to describe what we're, what we're discussing here today. And it applies to all sorts of AI. Um, but just to start, I guess, you know, one thing that um, maybe just to set the context for the discussion here, yeah. um, we won't go into a ton of detail of what ChatGPT is and what OpenAI is, but we do have some resources on our YouTube channel that you can go to if you want to learn more about it. Uh, in fact, I'll ask our marketing team to drop it in the chat here, um, some links to uh, recent discussions. Um, I put out a, a brief video just yesterday on my YouTube channel that just gives an overview of ChatGPT. And we also, a few weeks ago on this, this same live stream, we had a a discussion around what ChatGPT is and what it can do and the ways it's affecting businesses and the way we we do business. So we'll drop those links in the chat so you can learn more about what the platform is. So today we want to focus on sort of the the like I said the dark side of this. And just to set the context, I'll I'll kind of open it up by talking about a poll that I I published on LinkedIn just yesterday actually. So we even we haven't gotten um, a ton of results or the complete results yet, but um, we have 116 votes on this poll I put out. And in this question or this poll I, I posted to my network, I asked the question of what will be the biggest positive or negative impact of ChatGPT and OpenAI? And just to give you some context of what people are thinking about it, 44% uh, said it would make businesses more efficient. 34% said their data privacy and legal issues. 15% mentioned loss of jobs. And then 7% said something else other in the, the comment below. And we'll get to some of those comments here in a moment. But the reason I put this pull out there is because I wanted to get a feel for, you know, how excited people are about the technology versus how much people recognize the dark side or are concerned about the dark side. And certainly the 44% said that it's going to make businesses more efficient. That that seems reasonable. Um, but then it was interesting to see that 34% cited data privacy and legal issues as sort of the main thing that was on their mind. So I guess maybe to to start there, maybe to, to use that as a way to set the context for my first question, 
Uh, Marcus, what are some of the legal concerns or unknowns as it relates to ChatGPT and OpenAI and obviously data privacy and legal issues being one of them? Maybe we could start there and then mention anything else that you think are, are kind of concerns from your perspective uh, as an attorney. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, just generally with respect to, to OpenAI and ChatGPT, I mean, th this is probably one of the, an inflection point from a technology standpoint that I don't think we've seen before. I mean, to me, this is as revolutionary as you know, any, anything that has come before that, that just has the ability to transform the way we interact with people um, and, and just the levels of efficiency. And of course, with that kind of, of power, as they say, comes great, great responsibility, right? And, you know, one of the concerns that I have, if we're going to talk about the, the dark side, and I do, I do want to talk about some of the efficiencies and some of the, the, the positive things about this, because I think they're just they're enormous. Um, you know, but, but one of the issues with you know legal regulation and the law as it applies to technology has always been that the, the fact that technology is always you know three to four steps ahead of where existing laws and regulations and any kind of you know regulatory framework exists so we're always in a in a scenario where we, where we are catching up and i think you know one one of the fundamental issues from a legal perspective, and there's so many, okay? I mean, we can talk about this for hours, but, but one of the things that is problematic is um, the, these, these tools, these systems are being trained on, you know, a corpus of text, of speech, of data, um, and you don't have necessarily an understanding of what, what, what is made up of, of that body of information, you know, where, where are they getting it, for example, okay? And I think that creates a fundamental risk and a fundamental problem for a variety of reasons. One is, what is the accuracy or the reliability of the output? And we have an old saying in, in our industry, it is, you know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out, right? You put, you put bad data in, you get bad data out. So if there is no control or no regulation or no interest in the accuracy of, of what this thing is training on, then there's really no guarantee as to the accuracy or the reliability of what you're going to get out, the output of the content that you have created through this tool and the reliability of that. And that cre creates substantive issues from just a liability standpoint, from an IP infringement standpoint. You know, and I do think really that is going to be somewhat of a self-regulating issue because, you know, you're going to have different competing products. And if one is less reliable and the results are not as good as another, then people are naturally going to gravitate towards a, a different, a different product. But I think they're, they're inherent in that is just a lot of substantive risk. I mean, I mean, what data is being utilized and how good is the product that you're getting out of it and how do you utilize it? And then downstream, how do you protect the ultimate end user? So for example, if you're a software vendor that's incorporating AI generated content into your products, what kinds of reps and warranties, indemnities and limitations and liabilities are you going to take on with this unknown corpus of data? You know, mm. um, from, from a legal perspective, there has been recent litigation, primarily in the IP ownership context. So, you know, you've got, um, you know, chat GPT, or there's another, there's another entity, I think it's called Dolly, where it, um, you know, takes visual visual representations and creates um, modifications of that. And there has been uh, at least one one notable lawsuit and a couple of others. Uh, one filed by uh, Getty, which, which you know has all these uh, photographs. The AI tool has gone in, um, modified pictures of you know, uh, or, or used as a basis for the generated the generated output, the Getty images, and Getty says, hey, now, you know, that's an infringement of our intellectual property rights in those photos. Interesting. And that's problematic. You know, I mean, and how how as a company do you make representations of infringement, indemnity obligations, limit your liability when you don't know what the basis for the data has been? Yeah, that's really interesting. I I wasn't aware of that that lawsuit involving Getty, but I could see how that could be a challenge. And I think when I've thought about data privacy and, and IP or intellectual property types of issues with these AI platforms, I guess I've thought of it more from the, the, um, the end user perspective. You know, if I'm a, if I'm an employee at a company and I use chat GPT to, um, to have, have it analyze some sort of 
sensitive company information, some confidential company information, you know, what happens to that data and that sort of thing. But this is interesting. You're kind of talking about the other side, which I hadn't thought about, which is the model itself using information that's already out there and then who, who owns that data and what are the um, IP implications of that. We're here with Marcus Harris from Taft Law talking about the dark side of ChatGPT and OpenAI. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? I'll give you energy. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out. We're here in the midst of a conversation with Marcus Harris talking about the dark side of ChatGPT. Let's jump back into the conversation. What about, you know, when you are an employee, if I'm an employee at a, at a company or an organization and I use ChatGPT, let's just say I'm trying to use it, or I'm testing it out on my day-to-day -day job. What are some examples or some issues that I might face or be exposed to as it relates to intellectual property and or confidential information? How does that, maybe you could help us understand how that works and what that might look like from a legal perspective. Yeah, well, I, I, I've spent some time in my practice looking at uh, the, the, the rules and regulations that, that are, are you know, the, these, these entities uh, put out there in the, in, in the context of terms and conditions and what their obligations are to you. And there aren't a lot of them, to be quite honest with you. I mean, they do a very good job at saying, hey, you know, whatever you give to us is not going to necessarily be treated as confidential material. And we are going to be able to use that material in order to, uh, you know, iterate our, our product to make it better. So essentially, you know, whatever, whatever you are putting into the AI tool that you're using, you have to make an assumption that it is not going to be treated with any kind of confidentiality. It's not going to be treated as a trade secret. It's going to be open and available to the world. And in fact, Samsung, I think just in the last couple of weeks had a, had a, a, a chat GPT issue where, the, where somebody at Samsung uh, disclosed some proprietary or confidential information via chat GPT. You know, I think that's a huge concern because you know, they don't take responsibility, ChatGPT or any of these open, open AI platforms, when you're uploading your input into them, you know, it's, it's the wild west, essentially. You, have no, you should have no expectation of privacy, confidentiality, or really very much recourse to get that information back. And I think that's a huge uh, risk for any company. And you can't have you know, some guy in a, in a cube on the other side of the world you know, trying to do a more efficient job, but but then you know, having having Chat GPT, for example, generate substantive pieces of code and then incorporating that code into your generally available product, you know, that those create substantive issues of liability, infringement, um, and exposure uh, for for enterprise customers um, and, and enterprise vendors. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um... What about, you know, this just occurred to me as you're, as you're talking there, Marcus, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit of the early 2000s when Napster was becoming a thing. And, and the, those of you watching or listening that don't remember Napster, um, it was a platform that was developed that was that basically allowed you to, to share music. And it became an issue because obviously there were copyright issues and uh, bands like Metallica, I remember Metallica being kind of leading the charge on this, but Metallica sued Napster because they were creating this platform that allowed people to essentially steal their music and they weren't getting money for for what was rightfully theirs. And ultimately, over time, they, they sort of won that fight. They won that battle and Napster is no longer around, I don't think, or maybe they've 
been wrapped into some other company, but they're not as relevant as they were at one point 20 years ago. But they're sort of a flash in the pan. They sort of came and went because of some of those issues. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily the same thing or from a legal perspective, it's the same kind of issue. But is are these AI platforms or vendors, are they at risk because they're providing a platform that exposes potential confidential information and shares that confidential confidential information? Or is it just sort of like we and organizations as users of that uh, tool, it's just a risk that we just have to deal with? What, what are your thoughts on that? Or how do we well, balance I think this? it's really both. I mean, I think, I think from, from the platform's perspective, like I said, you know, they've got these pretty robust terms of use that have been generated by teams of attorneys that really do mitigate their liability and their risk of, of uh, you know, lawsuits and, and, and recourse. And, you know, that is being tested in the court system now with a variety of different lawsuits. So, you know, certainly I think if that corpus of material that they use to train their AI on contains proprietary or confidential information that has been accessed without authorization or is being used without express authorization, that creates a risk in the platform not only to the owners of the platform, the providers of that product, but even to potentially to users, you know? I mean, think about that for a second. As a user of ChatGPT, if you are now generating code that is, where that AI tool has been trained on someone's proprietary code that's confidential um, or protected by an intellectual property right, that the, the output that you have generated is now infringing and who's responsible for that infringement. You know, the, the AI provider attempts to wash their hands of it and we'll see how successful they are in doing that as these court cases move on. But then what is your liability as the person that generated that code? You know, I mean, it, the, the, the AI provider is going to point at you and say, well, you know, you, you represented that you had the right to, to do what you did. You put input in, um, you're responsible for what comes out. That's not necessarily true. So, I mean, you know, we're at the vanguard of a lot of these legal issues and it's super, super interesting. Um, and I think there's, there's certainly going to be some trailblazing, trailblazing, you know, legal precedent that comes out of these, that's going to define, you know, the parameters of, of how we all are going to use these systems in the future. So, um, you know, so, some of, some of the other issues associated with this too, are, I mean, you know, if, if, who who owns this output is is another fundamental question that really um, has been clarified at least to some extent by the copyright office in the last month or so, and the copyright office came down on this by saying, if you are inputting information and the output really has no human interaction or control or uh, discretion, that is not protectable. Uh, from a copyright perspective, it's not protectable intellectual property here at the copyright office. Um, it, so, you know, if you if you were to go in and say, OK, well, let's do um, a new painting in the style of Van Gogh and Monet. And now you want to apply for copyright protection. The copyright office is going to ask you certain questions about it. And if there is no human interaction or human um, control over what has come out, um, they're going to reject it from a protection standpoint, which is in contrast, and this is their example, you know, uh, a, a graphic novel that is, um, has text that is generated by a person or maybe partially generated by an AI tool, but then edited and vetted and modified by a person with AI images that are generated by AI. Um, there's going to be copyrightable elements to that, and that work would be protectable. Maybe not every element of that work, so you know, they're coming down with clarity, certainly at the copyright office and providing guidance to consumers and courts as to what is protectable and what is not. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. I, I was not aware of that, that the copyright office of the U.S. government is already providing those parameters. Um, and it, it leads me to another question here, which is that, you know, you see a lot of governments throughout the world, as you just described in the U.S., um, the governments are responding. Uh, fairly quickly. I mean, as fast as governments can move, I suppose um, they're they're responding quickly to to this threat or the the uncertainty around ChatGPT and OpenAI. In fact, some countries like Italy, for example, just a couple weeks ago, completely banned ChatGPT and said it's just a platform that there, it isn't legal uh, in their country. And then I think China just recently, a few days ago, did something similar. 
So governments, in some cases, are taking more extreme measures and just sort of trying to shut it down or trying to completely control or, or limit the exposure. Um, I know this is totally, you know, as attorneys, as an attorney, you I, you probably hate this question because I'm asking you to predict the future in a world yeah. of uncertainty. But but what uh, do you think that'll continue? That trend will continue with U.S. or with global governments getting more and more involved in trying to regulate it, similar to what they're doing right now with cryptocurrency and you know other things that could be perceived as threats to the you know sort of the status quo. Do you think that'll continue, or what what would your prediction be on that front? I, I would expect it to continue in certain jurisdictions. And I, I think for me, that really is the wrong approach because I think, uh, you know, just outright banning something without fully realizing the benefits of it, there's a there's a real risk in that, that your, that your technology industry is going to be left behind. And, you know, once you let the genie out of the bottle, so to speak, you can't really put it back in. And, you know, these things don't necessarily have borders, right? I mean, you know, if you've, if you've got, uh, you know, chat GPT that's generally available, there are, people are going to find a way to use it. Um, and certainly if it's providing efficiencies and, and benefits, um, you know, from a profitability standpoint, people are going to be clamoring to, to get their hands on it. And I think the right approach is regulation and, you know, developing a legal framework that is going to you know, mitigate whatever perceived risks are associated with this. And I think there's, there's, you know, they're right certainly in being concerned and you know whether we need what we call sui generis protection, um, which is, you know, kind of a bespoke brand new type of compliance system for this, or if we can leverage existing laws, you know, I, I don't know, maybe there's a mix of both. Maybe some, you know, some bespoke regulations need to be put in place to govern whatever concerns there are with, with open AI. But I, I certainly think that a framework that has existed you know, in, in law can be applied to this um, in a substantive way to mitigate risk. But certainly, I mean, you know, you look at implications with respect to banking and healthcare, you know, those are enormous implications, right? I mean, you've got, you know, faulty data that's got biases in it. You've got inaccurate data. I mean, you're talking about, you know, people losing their lives and you've got, you know, financial crises that could be perpetuated through AI issues. So, I mean, you know, the, the risks are, certainly enormous. And, you know, we, we talked about, you know, accuracy of the data earlier, you know, who's, who's responsible essentially for policing that and who is making sure that, you know, the data that is, is put in is, is accurate and, and the output is reliable. You know, there are no, as far as I, I know, and I could be wrong, um, and I'm sure somebody here in the chat uh, can correct me, you know, as far as I know, there are no, you know, systematic regulations to make that, that are applicable to AI. And I think you know, what, what that means then is from an administrative standpoint, and this is administratively burdensome, but as users, particularly in the corporate context, I mean, you've got to regularly, regularly assess whether that data is accurate. If you, you, you need to know, you know, what type of corpus is being utilized with that particular product that you're, that you're using. I mean, is it a private data system? Are they just going out on the internet and scraping data that's generally available? Well, that's going to be problematic from, yeah. from a liability standpoint, potentially. And you need to know that. You have to have an understanding of what those risks are. And then you can you know, craft policies internally to mitigate those risks. I, I look at this, you, you referenced Napster, and I think that's a good analogy and that's a good comparison. I look at this almost from, a, from kind of an, an, an open source context, right? I mean, what are the risks to your enterprise um, from open source software and what kind of a program have you put in place to minimize the risks associated with the liability that can be caused by open source software. It's kind of kind of similar in some ways when you're looking at, you know, unfettered use by your employees or consultants of open AI tools to make them more efficient. How are you going to moderate that? How are you going to mitigate the risks? What policies and regulations as an, as a, as an organization are you going to put in place to, to, to govern that kind of thing? Yeah. You mentioned a couple of things there. I want to come back to you um, in a second with, with follow-up questions. One is what you just said about, um, you know, policies you might put in place as an organization. That's I'll ask that later in the discussion here today. Maybe we'll dive into that. We're here with Marcus Harris from Taft Law talking about the dark side of ChatGPT and open AI. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control.
you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out. We're here in the midst of a conversation with Marcus Harris talking about the dark side of ChatGPT. Let's jump back into the conversation. One of the questions we have here um, on LinkedIn would be um, actually... Um, it just came in on LinkedIn. It was sort of related to what you were talking about a second ago, Marcus. I just need to find it because and Imal says, is Marcus comfortable speculating on the kinds of legislation we're likely to see for, for patenting AI generated IP? You were sort of talking about that a minute ago as far as what the US Copyright Office is is doing. Do you have any other thoughts beyond that? I know you're not a, an attorney, a global attorney. Your, your focus is obviously in US law or US based law. But what are your thoughts on that? Anything else you would add to that thread? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's that's a, certainly an interesting question. I mean, I think you know, is it patentable, and is there a patentability component to these things? I mean, I I really thought about this in the context of the copyright uh, component, and I certainly think that you know, if if, if there is novel um, you know output that is being created, you know, it very well could qualify for patentability and, and protectability. Um, you now, whether that you know, qualifies for patent protection in the United States. I, I think, you know, the, the, the hypothetical is just, you know, incomplete. So it's hard to say. So, you know, I talked about you know, something that lawyers call sui genesis protection earlier. And, you know, there, there may get, you may get to a point where you've got machines, you know, using machines to create innovative technology. And there may need to be some sort of a program put in place to protect that, that doesn't really rely on, you know, this, this component that the Copyright Office requires, which is this human intervention and, and human component to it. So I could definitely see, you know, legislation that would expand or clarify the patentability of technology that's being developed through open AI sources. So I think that could be something that comes down the pike. Um, but like I said, it's, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, without having specific models and things like that. But, right. but it's a really interesting question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, here's another comment. I'm actually going to pull this comment off of my LinkedIn poll that I mentioned earlier, the poll where I asked, you know, what the biggest positive or negative impact of ChatGPT and OpenAI would be. And in this thread, uh, one person, uh, Jonathan on LinkedIn, um, chose other. And then when you choose other, I ask people to put in the comments mm -hmm. what they think the real issues are. And I'm going to read this comment, even though it's uh, it's a bit longer. I'm going to, I'll try to uh, condense it a bit here, but it's, it brings up a really good question and something that I don't know that a lot of people have really thought about. Um, just like a lot of people haven't really thought about the confidentiality and IP issues with chat GPT. Um, but, but what Jonathan says in response to the poll is the items you have on the list, don't even begin to understand the complexity of issues we face. What about faking people with fake explosive messages, fake videos, propaganda, disinformation, irresponsible know-how like kids gaining dangerous chemistry know-how or the floodgates of security threats and exploits by generated code. Um, he goes on to just list a bunch of things that you could use AI for, um, you know, uh, persuading people into scams, fake family members calling you for cash. You don't, you can't tell that it's not a family member. I know right, right. internally at third stage, you know, we just like a lot of companies, we get a lot of phishing scams or attempted phishing scams. And could someone replicate me and create my face or voice and make it sound like I'm saying, hey, Marcus, I need you to wire me a million dollars right now. Um, yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Is that, do you see that being an issue or have you seen any issues of that recently? Well, I think that it's being an enormous issue. And I think that's really an, an issue from an ethical perspective, right? And there isn't necessarily, you know, 
Well, well, I mean, we talked about regulation and a legal framework, and I think you know that's something that would certainly need to be regulated, in my view, and, and whether the existing framework of laws and the patchwork of, of, of regulations could be applicable to that. I'm, I'm sure they can to some extent, but here, I mean, you've got this explosive technology that you know, it, it, and we can I'll use you as an example. I mean, you, you, you know, you're you're, you're pretty um, available on social media, right? I mean, people know what you look like; they know what your voice sounds like. And I think the someone's ability to you know fabricate you know a deep clone of your image and your voice, the cadence with which you speak, your intonations, intonations. I'm having trouble with that word. Um, I, I think that would be you know, pretty easy for one of these open AI platforms to, to, to replicate. And then all of a sudden, you know, we've got you, you know, or, or, or this deep fake version of you calling somebody, asking them for money or, or you, you know, whatever it is. I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the ability to, you know, um, clone your voice, um, mimic speech, cadence, tones, um, you know, it's really off the charts. And if you look at how a lot of those interactions have, have taken place from a commercial standpoint to date, I mean, you know, you've got, you go onto a, a website and there's a, a chat bot that interacts with you and it's this kind of halting stop and start interaction. Um, that's all going to change fundamentally. And, you know, there, there's the, there's the ability to use that for a nefarious purpose, which is, you know, the deep, deep fake fraudulent schemes, you know, causing havoc in financial markets, political, you know, you know uh, 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 crises, um, you know, but then you look at something as innocuous as Expedia.com, who just integrated a chat GPT API in, into their website, where you can just go online and say, hey, look, I'm look I want to go to Puerto Rico for the weekend. You know, can you tell me, you know, what flights are going there and what the price range is? And it just tells you like a normal person. I mean, that that's, you know, some, some of the positive, you know, efficient uses of it. But the, 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 the flip side of that is, is pretty dark um, and pretty scary. Yeah. 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 And yeah. for a, a real life example of the power of how someone could potentially use this technology in the nefarious ways you're describing, Marcus, um, I, I would invite everyone who is listening in, if you're on TikTok and you haven't already, go check out a... Um, an account on there called deep Tom Cruise. And it's a, and I've mentioned it before on this podcast, it's a fascinating account. It's actually pretty funny. Um, but it's apparently a software, uh, facial recognition and facial AI regenerative AI sort of software company that Tom Cruise is somehow involved with. He, he actually invests is he invests in it or he has a stake an equity stake in the company from what I understand. So he gave them permission to create this account called deep Tom Cruise. And it's sort of like a younger version of Tom Cruise, maybe 20 or 30 years ago. It kind of looks like maybe he was in his 30s or, you know, what he looked like 20 years ago, um, even though he still kind of looks the same, which, which is irritating as a, a middle-aged man. Um, but, uh, but if you go to this account, you cannot tell, or I cannot tell that it's not him. And if you, if you watch all the videos, they're pretty funny. It looks, his mannerisms, to your point, Marcus, the mannerisms are just like him. He's, he's kind of quirky in the way he talks and his personality is a little quirky. It's, he's pretty funny. Uh, in the video, but it, it, you cannot tell. I mean, I try really hard to notice some sort of deficiency or, or inconsistency, and you cannot tell his voice, his mannerisms, his look, his everything. So I think if you go to that, you look at that, it's pretty it's fascinating, but also kind of freaky because I fell for it. When I first saw it, I thought it was Tom Cruise. And you can see someone using that to your advantage. Oh, I, I think, you, you know, you ex extrapolate that to scenarios where you've got, you know, a deep fake of that quality of Vladimir Putin, you know, declaring nuclear war on the United States. And right. I, I, you know, I, I mean, that those have huge implications, right? And I mean, and, and if you take it to kind of more of a mundane level, you know, I get a ton of robocalls, both on my cell phone and my work, on my work phone. And I have a hard time um, every once in a while. Um, determining whether I'm talking to a real person or some sort of, you know, artificial intelligence and that artificial intelligence intelligence is not even that good. You know, I catch myself, yeah. you know, initiating a conversation with them and then realizing, ah, oh, okay, they're just trying to sell me, you know, an extended car warranty or, you know, whatever it is, Medicare or something. I don't know why I get those calls, but, um, you know, so it, I mean, it's going to really, it's going to really, really blow those things out of the water. And I think it's, it's, you know, it, 
you talk about existing regulations. Well, you know, are what regulations do you have? You know, do not call lists and that kind of thing. I mean, it's going to become incredibly easy for these people to, to, to inundate you with scams and the likelihood that you're going to fall victim to those now increases exponentially as well, which is certainly problematic. So I guess using, you know, asking a question I already asked you, but asking it in the context of what you just said, who's right. responsible for that from a legal perspective um, in the future? Or how do you think courts and governments, you know, throughout the world might settle that? Or will they settle it? Like is, is, you know, is it my fault if I fall for something like that? Is it the person, is it, obviously it's the criminal's fault, whoever creates the fraud or, you know, there's some, there's obviously liability there, but how, how at fault or at risk are we as people that might fall for it and or organizations or, or platforms that enable that sort of activity? You know, who, who's, how do you, how do you allocate the liability, I guess, in this whole equation from, from your perspective? Well, I, th I think the, the, the owners of these AI tools have to act reasonably, right? And I think there's an effort on their part to do that. And I think as long as they're meeting a certain standard of reasonableness and trying to prevent, um, you know, the nefarious use of their tools, really that, you know, you can only do what you can do, right? And I think if they're not being reckless or they're not being negligent, then I think the liability that they have is probably going to be on the lower end of the scale. Um, I think what you what you're going to get into a situation where you know there's a vulnerability in the AI platform that someone is able to exploit, kind of like a hack, and you know now starts to create something that can be utilized in a bad way. But then you're always going to have a situation where you know you're, you're going to have you know, criminal organizations or or, or you know, people with ill intent in developing you know, technology that's substantively similar and just as good, it's going to be focused on, you know, fraudulent activity. And how do you regulate that? I mean, you know, you can't, you can't regulate the criminals from not being criminals, right? I mean, you can have laws that, that hold them liable and, and, and you, know, you know, criminally responsible for those things. But certainly I think you know, you've seen these efforts, um, you know, I was watching a YouTube video the other day where, you know, someone was using, uh, I think it was chat GPT and they asked it how to make a bomb and, you know, it's, that's against one of its parameters of use. And it, it said, Hey, I can't tell you that, you know, sorry. So right. they're putting those kinds of safeguards into the system, but you know, there are, there are certainly, you know, I think workarounds uh, and, and criminals are certainly creative and they're going to get around those types of things. And they're going to put those in, in place. Certainly. Yeah. And you sort of allude to something that we, we started to talk about earlier, which is the, the inputs into these AI models and who's the arbitrator of truth. And, you know, I, I look to social media right now and the way governments throughout the world, including the U S government, where you and I are based, uh, the U S government has, in my opinion, sort of overreached on its moderation of discussion and speech on social media. And that's just my personal opinion. I, I don't want to open a can of worms for people that might agree or disagree with me on that, but that's, that's my personal opinion. So it makes me wonder, you know, if the U.S., which is known for its freedom of speech and um, that sort of thing, we we don't have freedom of speech in the way we used to. And, and the government has sort of cracked down to, to, term, to determine what it thinks is true and what it thinks is false uh, or misinformation. Um, how do you, I, I guess I worry a little bit that governments and other powerful bodies, even the AI platforms themselves, the AI vendors themselves may start to moderate or may start to create these biases to reflect their own personal biases in these AI models. And it, it just creates a, a bunch of questions of, around what, what is fact, what is opinion, what, you know, what's the quote unquote right answer. And you mentioned that earlier about, you know, these AI models are going out and gathering information that may or may not be true. And it's using that information that may or may not be true to create, you know, outputs that you, that it's feeding to its, its customers. So uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, how do you think that unfolds? I know I'm getting outside the legal realm here and we'll talk yeah. more about social well, and government I stuff, but. I think it's incredibly problematic. I mean, I think there's bias exists everywhere, right? And I mean, if you've got bias in your data and you've got bias in your team and, you know, the output then is dealt with as true uh, by, you know, uns unsuspecting consumers or utilize users of, of the technology, I, I think the implications are vast and, and, and incredibly problematic. I mean, you think about things like you know, just diagnosing certain types of, of healthcare issues. And, you know, you think that, well, there's whole populations that are more susceptible to this because of their race or their identity or, or you know, whatever it is. I don't want to get right. political either. But, you know, if, if 
there's bias in, in, in that area, it's going to sub substantively impact, you know, how people are diagnosed with, with disease potentially, right? Or if you think of, you know, financial or, or, or banking utilization of these tools, you know, who's going to get a mortgage now and what neighborhood and those types of things, you know, I mean, it, it, certainly, you know, the bias factor can be strong. Um, and, you know, how do you regulate that, especially if you're concerned about over-regulation, you know, you know, having, you know, images of Tom Cruise is one thing, and certainly with his consent, it's a totally different thing, but, you know, uh, how do you, how do you stop people from utilizing your images? And there's certain, certain laws in place to deal with that now. Um, but, you know, I think there's got to be some level of regulation as to the quality of the content and the quality of the output in, you know, I think for now, you know, the self-regulation is really kind of where you're at with this. Um, and, and, you know, we'll see, see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah it, I'm fascinated by that. Cause I think it's, uh, you know, I think anytime you have something as powerful as open AI chat GPT and something that has caught on so quickly, um, much faster than even cryptocurrency. I mean, cryptocurrency is, is sort of a mild version of of this in terms of the uh, sort of an alternative new platform, a new way of doing things. And you see how the governments throughout the world have reacted to that. They've tried and they're still trying to find ways to regulate uh, cryptocurrency. Um, and I think with this, anytime you have something like this, it, it, the governments just can't help themselves throughout the world. That's their job, I guess, in some ways is to rein it in. And so you wonder, how are they going to rein this in? What are they going to do? And does that diminish the value or does that uh, diminish the benefits to society or whatever the case may be? Yeah, well, that's always the risk, right? I mean, you know, you, if, you're, if you're an Italian right now, you don't even have the benefit of utilizing this technology because the regulation has been so extreme on one side that you, you know, it's been totally banned. And that's not, to me, it doesn't seem like a, a well-reasoned approach to dealing with the issues. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, self-regulation initially and see how it goes, and then, you know, government interference to the extent it's necessary or needed, um, and maybe in only certain industries or, or regulatory, you know, uh, applications of this where w would it be necessary right we're here with marcus harris from taft law talking about the dark side of chat gpt and open ai we've got a lot more to cover but first we're going to take a quick break you're listening to transformation ground control when things are big that should be small who can tell what magic spells will be doing are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out. We're here in the midst of a conversation with Marcus Harris talking about the dark side of ChatGPT. Let's jump back into the conversation. So here's a, a follow-up comment to one of your comments earlier, Marcus. This is from Frederick on LinkedIn. Uh, Frederick says, looks like Samsung found out by an internal audit that people had done an infringement. ChatGPT didn't go out and post a Twitter post with the information. So in other words, ChatGPT didn't expose that information necessarily or, or make it public, but the internal audit exposed the fact that people had shared that confidential information. It doesn't change the fact that now that confidential information is part of the open AI data set, and the right. data model, and it could be used. It, obviously, ChatGPT is not going to go post that information on Twitter, but it is information now that was confidential. It might've been intellectual property that is now part of the open AI model. I think that's an important, uh, important point there. Yeah, I think it's an important point too. It wasn't a data breach necessarily, right? I mean, it wasn't as if, if data had been exposed on the internet um, in, in an open and conspicuous way, though it had been exposed kind of you know within the corpus of this data set. 
and is being utilized potentially by all the users of ChatGPT now. And you know what what is being exposed and what's not being exposed, and, and how detrimental is, is it to Samsung in reality? It's hard to say, but it can't be a positive thing in any way, shape, or form, right? I mean, you know, and this is why I think you know we we talk about government regulation and then self regulation of of these uh, tools, the owners of these tools. I, I think as an organization, say you take a Samsung you've got to have an internal policy. You've got to have internal regulations that are going to govern what your, what your employees can and cannot do. And my understanding is that uh, they had, Samsung had, had shut down any internal use of chat GPT. And then, you know, I guess there was some pushback internally or they reassessed that position thought it maybe wasn't the best position and then look at what happened. Right. But I, I think, you know, as, as an attorney and, and certainly as a former in-house attorney, you you really have to um, look at this with a careful eye and and you know look at the benefits and the risks because you, you would like your your company to take advantage of the efficiencies and the business people are going to want to do that but you know you've got to assess the risk and put in a a, 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 a a regulatory scheme internally that that mitigates risks but also you know increases you know the utilization of the tool if you can and that's not an easy thing to do right yeah absolutely. You know, here's a question from LinkedIn. This is Carolyn on LinkedIn, although I'm, I'm wondering if it's really Carolyn. Do we know? I don't know. We'll, we'll, uh, <laughs> it might be a deep fake version of Carolyn, but this alleged person named Carolyn, <laughs> I'm kidding, Carolyn, but she says uh, OpenAI's privacy policy for their paid premium API indicates that they do not use our proprietary data to tune their data model, nor do they store our data. Other than their privacy policy, how can we be assured that our sensitive data is secure? So I guess, first of all, I didn't, you know, I'm not aware of that. I'm not aware of what their privacy policy is, to be honest. I'm not sure, you know, I can't validate that that is what it says, that they won't use it to tune their data model or store their data. Um, I guess that begs a question of, well, then what, what, you know, what's the difference between what they do store and using their data model versus what they don't store? I, I'm not sure what the, you know, how, what the differentiators are. Is that something you're familiar with or, or have any thoughts on? Well, you know, I've looked at the chat GPT uh, slash open AI, um, yeah, terms of use. And, you know, my understanding is that it's pretty vague and there's a lot of nuance and gray area that, that you know, would, would allow them to utilize uh, any information that, that you would submit to be able to, to at least, you know, modify the platform or make it more efficient. Um, but, you know, I, I certainly, you know, I, I think, I think the, 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 the bright line rule here for me as an attorney you know, regardless of even what the, the terms of use say, um, if, if you're going to be submitting information that is confidential or proprietary or trade secret into this system, you know, th that is a fool's errand right there. And that is not something that you should be doing or allowing as a company, um, encouraging your employees to do. And there should be some restriction internally um, that you impose as a company to prevent that from happening. Because to me, I think the likelihood that that information is going to be utilized in some way um, is very high. And I think the risk to the company, you, you don't know what it is. I mean, I think in the Samsung example, you have a scenario where, you know, you've got information that's part of the corpus um, and it's being, you know, utilized in some way, shape or form. How substantively, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, talk to Getty Images. And, you know, they're certainly not happy that their proprietary copyrighted photographs have been part of or incorporated into the corpus and are being utilized to generate images. You know, what's the infringement from, from a real practical perspective right there? In some ways, it doesn't matter because you know, there's statutory, statutory liability. And I think that the total damages that they're seeking is something like $12 million. So, you know, the, 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 the risks and the perceived risks are really, you know, maybe don't equal or you know, don't aren't, aren't the same but certainly from a liability and risk perspective you've got to manage it and mitigate it yeah yeah absolutely yeah great point it's it's uh, a lot of what we're talking about here today it seems to come back to a common theme which is we don't really know you know we're, we're talking about a lot of uncertainty and a lot of speculation of what might happen in the future some of this has already happened but i'd say you know it's probably 90 percent or more of of this that we haven't really figured out or settled yet as it relates to ChatGPT. Um, right. 
you know, one of the one of the things that we haven't talked about that's directly related to the Samsung incident and the utilization of this information is what do you do as an organization when you have a huge, you know, data set of user information? Let's say, you know, you're you're a company that's utilizing, you know, AI and you're using or you're using a software product that incorporates AI to, to analyze, you know, user uh, end user, you know, data confidential information, proprietary information, personally identifiable information, and that's being utilized in the data set. You know, what are your obligations with respect to GDPR, um, you know, mm -hmm. some, some of the other, you know, privacy regulations, and what are your, not only what are your, your, your responsibilities, um, but what are your liabilities with respect to doing that? And, you know, certainly I think GDPR, you know, would say that you've got to be transparent and you've got to get consent. Um, and you need to certainly let people know if you know there, there's an automated dis decision making with respect to their personally identifiable information. Um, but the liability associated with utilizing all of that data, um, you know, and it could be something as innocuous as using you know open uh, open AI to, to get you know market analysis or just user data in general, you know, statistics on how they're using your products. But you're now utilizing personally identifiable information, and you're putting that into the AI system. You know, that is problematic, I would, I would think. Yeah, you, you mentioned a great point with GDPR in Europe, which is the, the data privacy law that was enacted a few years ago uh, in the EU. Um, and that's a great point. I mean, you've got GDPR regulations that sort of limit, you know, what can or can't be shared or used in, in this in this way. Do you what kind of confidence do you have that these open AI models and, and uh, ChatGPT and Google's Bard and, you know, any other um, AI platform like this, what, how, how confident would you be that they are compliant with GDPR and other privacy laws? Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not so sure that, that they're, the, the way you utilize these tools, it's really, you know, if, if you're going to be putting in the personally identifiable information into the tool, you're the one that needs to be compliant with with the, the you know the regulations that are governing your use of your customers personally identifiable information or data and so you know I, i'm not so sure that it's it's really a question of you know how compliant is chat gpt necessarily you know what does it allow you to do with personally identifiable information can it identify it does it preclude the use of that information that's one question but if you've got you know some sort of an open open AI application or tool that you're utilizing in connection with your business, and you're trying to do, use that tool um, to analyze your customer data, you know, what obligations do you have, and do you have an understanding of how that data is being used within that tool set? You know, again, are you putting out you know personally identifiable information into a corpus of data that's now going to be analyzed by this you know open AI system? You know, that's certainly a, you know a big deal and a problem. Something that you, you need to be aware of, right? Yep, and um, it's a great point, um, Carolyn on LinkedIn. By the way, just for those that are wondering, she did confirm that it really is her. Um, so it must be true then. Right. If she came back electronically and told me it's her, I've got to believe her, right? Um, right, right. Now, now I'm going to be skeptical. <laughs> Anytime I see anyone on social media or even a video, I'm going to be skeptical of whether it's really them. Um, Here's a comment from, uh, or a question from Sam Graham on LinkedIn. Sam says, sometimes perception is reality. If enough people believe false information that chat GPT publishes, is there a danger of that causing actions that we wouldn't want? For example, if it said the vitamin C was bad for us, the results would not be good. What are your thoughts there? Well, yeah, I, I think that is problematic because, you know, that that's about the accuracy and the truth of what the output is. And, you know, if you've got bias and bad data that is you know, replicating within that system and you're getting, you know, output that's just not correct, you know, how do you, how do you police against that? How do you make sure that, you know, people's confidence in, in the accuracy of the data is, is where it needs to be? You know, again, the implications associated with that are pretty enormous, right? I mean, you've got you know, you know, facts coming out that are saying you know something isn't good for you when in fact it is, and, and you know the perception certainly is the reality. Right. So I guess just to 
sort of put a bow on this or wrap this all together. Um, we've talked about a lot of uncertainty. We've talked about what we think might happen in the future. We've we've talked about some of the the landscape of uh, what some of the risks are. But what closing recommendations would you have for organizations that are concerned about the potential downside of ChatGPT? You mentioned before um, policies that organizations might put in place. I mean, what would you do if you were, you know you're giving us advice, uh, you know, as an attorney and you're our, our corporate counsel, which you actually are third stage is corporate counsel. But but if you if you were a corporate counsel to others on the on the call here today, what would you suggest they do to navigate this uncertainty? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's 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 somewhat similar to some of the things that we say when you're trying to adopt ERP software and, and, and technology in general. OK, I mean, you can't do this out of kind of a FOMO mentality, right? You can't be an organization that says, hey, we want to implement, you know, AI and incorporate it into our systems to, to make use of the efficiencies that we believe are there. You have to have a solid and legitimate business case for utilizing that piece of technology, just like any other technology. Um, it's got to make sense for your business, right? And then once you have determined that there is a business case to use a particular AI tool, you want to make sure that you have an understanding of how the vendor or the provider of that tool trains their AI product. What data is it is it using? Is it you know general data on the internet? Is it proprietary information um, that only they have access to? How how you know, what's the quality of that information? All of those are key components that that you need to make a determination of, right? Um, and then you know, you've you've got to in my view, you know, do the necessary due diligence to make an, to, to have an understanding of, um, you know, what kind of intellectual property rights do you need to utilize the AI tool? Okay. What kind of intellectual property representations and warranties do you need to flow down to any end users or customers um, that are going to use products that are associated with or generated by or incorporate the AI technology? Um, and then, you know, once you've got kind of that framework in place as to what your risks and liabilities are and how you're going to mitigate them, you know, what's the use policy, you know, for, 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 for utilizing the, the AI platform. And I think you've got to think about that in two ways. One is there's going to be a different appetite for risk and risk tolerance if you're utilizing AI internally like Samsung, okay, or you're utilizing it externally, like Microsoft, right, or, mm -hmm. or Google or something. I mean, those are two fundamental different use cases, and they carry fundamentally different you know, risk mitigation models. Um, and you might have kind of a dual track where you're using it internally to increase your own efficiencies, and then you're using it externally in order to generate more revenue and provide better customer experiences or, or whatever. Um, you know, I think those are really the fundamental things. I mean, th there's other implications, you know, with respect to, uh, you know, mergers and acquisitions. I mean, if you're, if you're acquiring companies, you need to understand, you know, what kind of AI components they might have embedded in their products, how they're utilizing those, what the risk to your organization is once you complete that merger or acquisition. And then again, I'll come back to, you know, how, you know, we, we talked about reps and warranties, from a contractual perspective, you know, that you're going to flow down to your end users, but what about just documents in general that you've signed? You know, what's your limitation of liability? What kind of reps and warranties have you made to other companies regarding, you know, the use of intellectual property, your ownership of intellectual property, and, and does that need to be modified? You know, I mean, this is not a mature area, right? Even when you look at the terms of use that these AI tools put out, they're not drafted in a way that accommodates every kind of you know, potential scenario. Um, and so you as a user have to take on this level of due diligence to make sure that you've got the proper scheme in place internally to, to mitigate the risk and to maximize the use and efficiency of these tools to take advantage of them. Right. Yeah, that's well, yeah. well said. I hadn't thought about the, the difference between internal use and the public facing use or customer facing use of these tools. And, uh, you know, recognizing the need to treat those differently and mitigate risk differently, depending on what what the purpose is or what the use of the product is. I think in some cases, like I'll, I'll give you an example, just from my personal experience, you know, I've, I've, I know that there's parts of our team 
at third stage, they're using ChatGPT, and I didn't tell them to. It's not a policy that you need to use it. We didn't decide to roll it out company wide or anything like that. It's it's a, a technology that anyone can go use, just like you know Google. I don't tell people to use Google, but they do. They use it. They use it when they need to go find something or they're looking for something. And similarly, people are using ChatGPT in that way. But we've we've started started to um, reinforce the the caution that needs to be applied here, both in terms of information that might get leaked, but also not revealing, um, not relying too much on ChatGPT because we, just like Google, you know, we, we're not going to go Google best practices for how to make a digital transformation successful. Um, that's not what we do. It's based on our experience and that sort of thing. But we might augment that experience with information we find there. But we also have to recognize that just because it's on the internet, just because it's on ChatGPT doesn't necessarily mean it's it's true. And so you have to take it with a grain of salt. And so I think just education is a big part of it too. And making sure that in addition to having policies in place, that people are educated of what these risks are and uh, yeah. you know, just how you need yeah. to be careful with some of that information. Absolutely. I mean, and the risks, the risks are pretty big. It could be, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, so we didn't talk about this at the beginning of the interview. We sort of, I think we were both so excited to jump into this topic. We, we glossed over it, but maybe tell us just quickly a little bit about your, uh, you know, sort of your law practice and what it is you do personally, as well as what Taft does. And maybe just let us know how we can get a hold of you. If anyone's interested in chatting with you more about this topic yeah. or they're concerned about it or want to bounce ideas off of you, how, how they get a hold of you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like you can, you can go to Taft law. I'm, I'm on there. Uh, Marcus Harris, um, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, you've got a YouTube channel. I mean, I think, you know, Mark service attorney is, is the way to, the easiest way to find me. Unfortunately, you got to put attorney cause there's a, a, a couple of, uh, athletes, uh, that, that rank a lot higher than I do. So, um, but regardless my, you know, my practice is really focused on intellectual property and technology issues, uh, general intellectual property issues, and certainly, you know, enterprise software related issues from litigation to contract drafting and negotiating. Um, and so we're at the forefront of a lot of these data privacy issues and certainly issues just like this that are starting to come up more and more in our practice and really impact our clients in a big way. And, you know, the, the approach that we have to all of this is it's not it's not the Italian approach where you just say no. It's really an approach where let's get to yes. Let's figure out how to mitigate the risks in a, in a manageable way to get you as a business or a consumer to, you know, to utilize what you need to use. But as long as you're aware of, you know, what you're getting yourself into and can mitigate it, that, you know, that's, that's the way you like to approach these things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's well said. And, and, uh, you know, that that's why you're such a perfect guest for this topic because of your intellectual property focus and background as well as your software technology, uh, background and focus as well. So, um, I imagine in the next few months, you're going to have a lot more to talk about as, as you get more engaged in, some, in, in resolving some of these issues for, for more and more organizations that, that you work with or more and more clients that you work with. So uh, we might have to do a touch point here later in the year to see where we are. Any, any new updates on, on this whole ChatGPT open AI thing? All right. Thank you, Marcus. Great stuff. Very interesting topic. I learned a lot in that discussion. Uh, so much so that I think uh, there's more discussion to be had around it. In fact, uh, Kyler and I will unpack some of the threads and comments and patterns in that discussion. And uh, thank you to the audience as well for all the great questions there. I uh, had some really good uh, questions and comments that, that went along with that. And clearly a, a hot topic or clearly a topic of great interest in the technology and digital transformation space. So when we come back, we'll have a brief discussion to sort of debrief and recap some of the, the high points of that discussion. But first we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Welcome back to 
Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling, here with Kylo Cheatham from Third Stage Consulting. And you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So, Kyler, we just had Marcus on the show talking about the dark side of ChatGPT. What were some of your thoughts or takeaways from that conversation? Well, first of all, I'm terrified, you know, a little bit (laughs) (laughs) around all of, you know, the the potential um, downsides. I mean, it's such an important conversation to have, especially, you know, in a in an organization um, and kind of trying to understand how you protect not only your intellectual intellectual property, but your data. So I guess when we look at it and you look at organizations now, especially as leaders, executive leaders of organizations, how do you ensure that your workforce is is not creating risk for your implement implementation or intellectual property um, when it comes to an example like Samsung, um, which we which some of our commenters mentioned that they had some intellectual property that they actually use to fix code um, via chat GPT uh, that was found via that internal audit. So what are some safeguards that organizations can do now, knowing it is such a viral trending topic, to ensure that they're educating their workforce or creating kind of some safeguards around these, these new technologies that do offer a lot of opportunity, but also risk at the same time? Yeah, it's a great question. And I agree with Marcus's assessment or his comment. They, I think he made it a couple times in the discussion that the answer is not necessarily to ban it. So I, I don't know that if I'm the leader of any organization that I would say chat GPT is banned within this organization, but I would put clear policies and procedures in place around what it can and can't be used for. Because I think a lot of this is pure education. I, mean, I, I don't think that, I mean, I guess I don't know the Samsung situation, but I, I suspect if I had to guess, I would guess that those employees at Samsung that were caught or they were exposed during the internal audit as having shared confidential information, I bet they didn't know that there's a risk with that. I bet they thought they're just talking to this generative AI model. They're going to get an answer back that they're looking for, and they're going to go on and continue with their work. I don't think, you know, most people are probably going to think that there's a risk, but hell with it. I'm just going to put the information in there anyway. I don't think that's going to be the case with most most employees. Now, there are going to be nefarious bad actors or people that don't care about confidential information or flat out want to steal it. That's the case now. And that, you know, that's not going to change. Um, so, you know, you're going to have some of that, but I don't think it's going to be because of generative AI or open AI or chat GPT. I think if people want to steal information or be reckless with it, they're going to steal it or be reckless with it, whether it's via email or paper or, or something like chat GPT. So I think a, a big part of it is recognizing you're going to have the exceptions like that, where it's the, you know, the people that are intentionally or recklessly doing things, in which case you need to have controls in place like internal audits and like other safety precautions like that. But I think it also goes back to just general education and policies and procedures. Um, it is something I would not just throw into an employee handbook and make everyone sign off on a new employee handbook without telling them like, hey, here's a major change and here's why it's in there and that sort of thing. So I think for leaders, it's a lot of uh, just communication and transparency and recognizing people are going to use it whether you want them to or not. So, you know, you could probably set aside the argument of whether you should let them or not, because they're probably just going to do it. So you might as well assume they're going to do it and then figure out what the right answer is and and put some specific guidelines for what is and is not acceptable in using ChatGPT in the workplace and with confidential information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And I, I think Marcus made a great point about that internal audit and the importance of those. So what what would be your recommendation for the frequency um, of internal audits, knowing that technology is changing so fast? That's a great question. Um, and I'm not, nor was I ever an internal auditor, an auditor of any sort, but um, just based on how, you know, we've seen like with publicly traded companies, I think they have to do quarterly, uh, at least for publicly traded companies in the United States, I should say. Um, that are trading on the U.S. one of the U.S. stock exchanges. There's a law called Sarbanes-Oxley, which determines you know what kind of uh, controls and governance you need to have in place as an organization, and that's a way to ensure that you have the right kind of controls so that people aren't stealing money or that you don't have system and processes set up that are uh, expose yourself to risk of that happening. So there's certain segregation of duties and certain specific policies and procedures you need to have in place, but also audit to make sure they're actually being followed within the organization. I think you need to do those internal audits like quarterly, if I remember correctly, on a, on a Sarbanes-Oxley 
compliant company. I could be wrong on that, but I think it's quarterly. If anyone here is an auditor here in the US and you're, and you're listening, I'd love to you know just drop it the chat if I'm wrong and please correct me. There's a probably 50% 50 chance that I'm I'm wrong on that. So please correct me if that frequency is wrong. But regardless of what you do with Sarbanes-Oxley, you can set your own tempo you know, to increase that frequency if you'd like uh, for something like ChatGPT. I'd, I'd recommend more frequent audits and communication early on just because it is so new and so many people don't fully understand the implications um, of this, including myself. If I look at myself two, three months ago th at the start of 2023, I really had no idea what ChatGPT was or how it worked. So um, for me, you know, someone who's presumably knows more than most in the tech space about emerging technologies, the fact that I only learned about it just a few months ago means that, you know, others might have just might just now be learning about it or just don't know about it still. So there's an opportunity here for you to get ahead of it uh, because it is so new. And I think that's what um, what leadership needs to do. And they just need to embrace the fact that it's there and figure out how they're going to uh, set it, set into place communications and policies that are going to mitigate those risks. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely something important to stay aware of. Um, I'll ask this question to you because I, I don't, but I don't know if you'll be able to answer it from the contracting side. But we've seen kind of chat GPT be white labeled in some additional um, CRM systems or other ERP systems um, and kind of moving towards jumping on that trend. Is there anything that you really need to be aware of as a business when going into the contracting, knowing that these technologies do exist within the overall system? Is there any considerations around intellectual property or something like that? Um, that you should now be more kind of hyper vigilant on. Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and and I'll be honest. I mean, this is something that I'm struggling with because um, I'll give you an example. Or I'll tell you what I mean, and I think this is where you're going with it. But but when you look at like our CRM that we use at Third Stage is called HubSpot, and HubSpot recently rolled out something called ChatSpot, which is essentially a, a functionality where you can enter a question and it'll go into your CRM system or into your instance of HubSpot and pull whatever it is you're asking for. So for example, I went in and tested and said, you know, how many new contacts have registered for information on our website in Europe in 2023 so far? And it took 10 or 15 seconds and it thought, and it came back with an exact number and it gave me exactly what I needed. I didn't have to go fumble around and find a report and run a report on it. I just asked the question. So it made it a little bit easier, but I did wonder when I did that, I was, I was wondering back to Marcus's point, I was wondering if if I asked that question, I don't know what the privacy policy is as it relates to the connection between HubSpot and, and uh, ChatGPT in this case, because the way ChatSpot works is it, it's actually using ChatGPT to answer the, whatever the question is. It just happens to integrate back to HubSpot, our CRM system. So I don't know how that works, but it is that's a really good point. And that's probably something that maybe we could ask Marcus as a follow-up is we talked a lot about the privacy policy for ChatGPT, if you're a direct user of ChatGPT, and I think uh, someone on the on the interview uh, asked the question around that, or, or they made a comment about the privacy policy and what it says, um, but I'm not sure how that works with with HubSpot or any sort of third party system that integrates with ChatGPT, which, to your point, is becoming more and more common. So that's a great point and great question that I don't have a good answer to at this point. But if someone does in the in the chat below, you know, be sure to. Be sure to drop it here. Maybe even drop drop it into ChatGPT while you're at, so it so it can answer that question in the future. Or maybe we should pull up ChatGPT while we're talking here and, and ask it and see what see what it says. I did ask it that. Um, I actually have exactly what it said when it oh, came okay. because when you guys were talking, I was like, I wonder if you just ask ChatGPT what its its privacy policy is, and it it laid it out for me. I mean, I would still think that like you know if I'm investing a bunch of money as a business into a system that I, those kind of vague terms about we take data privacy very seriously, those don't really do it for me, right? I would yeah. need it really laid out to say like, what what is the risk to my customer base? What is the risk to my employees? Um, because utilizing that third party, like to give you an example, um, um, HubSpot chat or whatever we call it, um, we've been testing it, my team and I, and we, we can give it prompts like create a picture of a dog looking at a computer. And it does, that. you know, so it, it really the opportunity is endless. If I'll post the picture here in the comments so you guys can see what we, we came up with. It's not beautiful art, but at the same time, the system is understanding. And when you're looking at something that you're creating custom reports to your or custom intellectual property, graphics, all of those different emails, um, other other types of things, there's a lot of data concerns uh, or security concerns around it. So I just wondered if you had 
kind of run into that with any of your client conversations of how do we make sure that that we're not just kind of putting ourselves out there into the internet so that everybody can see kind of our confidential communication. So yeah, it and that your your response here, what you just said reminds me of a comment Marcus made. Remember he was talking mm-hmm. about the um the Getty images and how Getty yeah. was suing I think it was ChatGPT he was talking yeah. about how they're suing ChatGPT because it's accessing Getty images to use that as a starting point for some of the art that it creates. So I suppose that is, I don't know if that's similar to, this is why I'm not an attorney because I, I, I don't operate well in the black and white world. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if that's similar to, um, you know, what you're saying. I wonder if that's similar to the Getty situation. You're talking about third party systems and data and information and what's the privacy policy there and who owns it, all that stuff. Yeah, just a lot to unpack. And certainly, um, we'd love to hear from the audience, you know, some other risks that you think might be associated, or I guess considerations, um, because risk can have a negative connotation. And obviously, all emerging technology has amazing opportunity to create efficiencies um, throughout organizations and have a positive impact. But it's important to understand, specifically from a risk assessment side, that that dark side of that overall conversation. So we'll, you know, we'll keep up with Marcus. He's usually on a lot of our um, thought leadership and he does a lot of different blogs on demand. So if you'd like to hear kind of more about that, uh, we can source some additional information from him. Yeah. Yeah. He's a great person to reach out to if you do have questions about that, or if you're an organization that's looking to try and get a policy in place or some employment agreements or employment hand employee handbooks or whatever, you know, he'd be someone you could bounce ideas around with, um, to, to get to the bottom of that. But, but I do agree. This is something we'll have to keep an eye on. We'll have to watch and see how this unfolds. And something tells me that, uh, in the next few weeks, few months, or maybe even by the time this podcast actually appears in the public, things will have changed so much. And you and I will know so much more than we know right now at this very moment. That's what's so fascinating about it is every time I, we have a, a topic or every time we, um, talk about it, it seems like it's obsolete within minutes or hours or days. In fact, I, when I recorded my, um, I recorded a video recently that was, uh, I think, last week published on my YouTube channel that was uh, basically what is ChatGPT and what are the pros and cons. And I remember the day I filmed, you know, one of our team members, literally like five minutes before I was going to film it, gave me an article and said, oh, you got to see this. And it was the article about how um, Elon Musk and Bill Gates and some other tech industry leaders were calling for a, a pause on any development of AI for six months while the world figures out what's going on. So that was just an example. And then it was about two weeks prior to it getting published that I filmed it. So two weeks go by, you know, between the editing process and the review that we do internally and all that stuff. So two weeks later, video appears on YouTube and I feel like already, you know, there's stuff that I, I, I heard when I watched it and thought, Oh, I should have talked about this or that, but I didn't know it at the time. So this is something that I think is going to continue to evolve very quickly. So we'll, we'll continue to keep a pulse on that here on this podcast, among other topics, of course. So. Well, good. Well, good stuff. Well, uh, thank you for the the great questions there, uh, both to you, Kyle, and to to the audience, and and uh, most certainly to Marcus as well for being here. Really appreciate having him on the show. So we're going to uh, shift gears now and uh, broaden our purview a little bit, broaden our lens of what we're going to talk about here as it relates to digital transformation. We're going to sort of pull back here and look at broader trends or, or just broader lessons from the last five years of digital transformations. And uh, the reason we're talking about last five years in particular is because uh, we recently celebrated our five-year anniversary at Third Stage Consulting. So you know, it was five years ago this month that uh, I started the company, and uh, here we are, a much, much different, much bigger, much more successful company than we were five years ago when we had zero revenue and uh, no clients, and I had no idea if it was going to work or not. So it's, it's, it's a good spot to be. So now it's fun to look back and see what we learned from our, uh, it was about 300 or more different clients that we've worked with in the last five years. We want to try to summarize some of those lessons. And we're going to do that here uh, between you and I, Kyler. We'll try to unpack what, we, what we've learned here. So we'll do that as soon as we take a quick break. But first, we'll take that break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or 
download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham, and we have new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check out past episodes on there and stay tuned for future episodes as well. So we have an exciting conversation we're going to have here between Kyler and myself and others from the third stage consulting team. And we're going to talk about five years of digital transformation lessons in the technology space. And again, the reason why we're focused on five years is because we celebrate our five-year anniversary as a company this month. We've worked with over 500, or I'm sorry, with over 300 different client organizations throughout the world uh, in our uh, four primary offices. We're, we're based in North America, which is where Kyler and I are uh, in the United States, but we also have offices in Europe, uh, in London in particular, as well as Asia Pacific and uh, Africa as well. So. We have multiple offices throughout the world, clients throughout the world, consultants throughout the world, and we're going to try and summarize everything we've learned, you know, qualitatively, what are those uh, big lessons and takeaways from our five years of lessons of working with those clients. So to sort of guide this conversation, I'll turn it over to you, Kyler. Well, thanks, Eric. Excited to have this conversation with the team today. So let's get into it. First and foremost, happy fifth anniversary to third stage, two most tenured um, employees. So congratulations to you, Adam and Eric. We're going to um, get into some fun questions. First, before that, um, if you don't know Eric and Adam, I'm going to let them introduce themselves um, and just talk a little bit about their role here at Third Stage. So Adam, let's start with you. Yes, my name is Adam Tino. I'm Managing Director at Third Stage Consulting Group. Um, you know, five years ago, Eric came to me and said, I'm starting a new company and would you like to join? And I said, well, that depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, obviously it turned out fairly well <laughs> for, uh, for each of us. Really proud to be here. This is a great milestone for, for third stage consulting group. So glad to see, um, so many people from so far away. I see Lebanon, India. Uh, the Netherlands, I saw um, Nigeria in there, of course, Denver, London. Like, Whoa, you're stealing my job things. there, buddy. Well, you know, it's, uh, I just am fascinated by it. I love our reach. <laughs> I love our company. It's just a, a great position for us to be in and um, just a great resounding success that shows with the people that love to join us on these. So thanks for having me. Absolutely. And over to you, Eric, obviously CEO and founder, um, maybe give us kind of your overall vision of starting the company and some exciting milestones um, to kick us off today. Sure. Well, I'd, I'd love to say that I had this really deliberate, well thought out strategy when I started the company, but that wasn't quite how, how it worked. Um, I was a bit terrified when I started the company, um, having left my previous company that I'd started before and to start this one was, was, uh, a very difficult decision. It was a hard time for me uh, personally. Um, so it's really cool to see that not only were we able to survive, not only was I able to just feed my family. That's really my main goal to start was just to make sure, you know, I could not disrupt our, our income as a, as a family. Um, so it's cool to see us going from that sort of survival mode. Will we make it um, mode quickly into high growth mode? And um, I remember about three months in, or maybe less realizing, wow, this, I think this is really going to take off and I think this is going to work really well. So, um, and I think the other cool thing about us as a company that I'm proud of is that, um, our team and our company really values that tech agnostic client focused mm -hmm. approach, you know, in, in a industry that is sketchy at best, uh, at times and unethical at, at its worst and illegal at its worst. Um, I, I am proud of the fact that we can be sort of that, that beacon or that uh, North Star for organizations that just want trusted advice and someone to represent them uh, in their transformations and really help them through their transformations without trying to sell software, without trying to, um, you know, sell their biases. So um, love the team we've built. And um, I think it's, uh, you know, we've gone from just myself and, uh, and Adam and 
my wife, who's also our CEO or CFO, she, she should be our CEO. Should, yeah. um, I, I really report to her, but, <laughs> but uh, we've gone to just a handful of us to now 70 people plus uh, worldwide. So it's, it's been a great trajectory and a uh, great group of clients as well that we work with. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I was counting worldwide. It's, it's about a hundred, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's close. It's, it's getting closer to hundred. I, I lose track um, yeah. day to day. So yes, it's probably, you're probably closer than I am. <laughs> well, excellent. Well, today um, to kind of celebrate all of our um, key learnings, we, we were going to focus on our top five key lessons from digital transformation to ensure that we provide those um, great best practices to our amazing audience. Let's start out with a little bit of would you rather digital transformation edition. So this is an audience, engage, audience engagement as well. Um, so you can put your answer in the actual chat wherever you're joining us from today and, and we'll have a little fun. So let's start with just a basic would you rather um, to get us started. So would you rather have a pet unicorn or a pet dragon? So unicorn or dragon, you can mm -hmm. pop the emoji too in the chat wherever you're joining. Um, but let's go to you for, first, Eric, unicorn or dragon? Oh, man. I was, I was hoping you'd ask Adam first. I can't pass <laughs> this early probably, huh? <laughs> to her take a million. Um, I'd say probably a dragon just because dragons are cool. They breathe fire. They're intimidating. Uh, they're dominant. Mm -hmm. um, unicorns to me strike me as something that, not that dragons are real, but you to me, unicorns are just a made up sort of thing. But dragons are totally real, right? Um, so, so to me, they, they seem a little bit more realistic. Um, so that's my well, knee jerk reaction. I've never really thought through that before. So that's just a knee jerk reaction. After further analysis, I could change my mind. That's, that's where I stand right now. <laughs> well, this is the goal of this game is there's no it depends allowed. So we're, we're getting into the real meat of it. So Adam, right. unicorn or dragon. And just remember, our two year old daughter is listening um at this point so you do have a bias he's there <laughs> well, i've seen game of thrones uh so <laughs> i'm gonna go with a dragon because dragon. That's, that's you know i had i had to find myself thinking if i was stuck with a dragon or a unicorn and had to fight somebody with the other uh where would i rather be and i would rather be on a dragon you know it's just yeah. There you go. And, and Darren, which I assume is is from Wales on LinkedIn, told us, she's teaching us that the dragon is actually one of the national emblems of Wales. So there we go. We learn something new every day. But we got a lot of dragons. I will say, um, you know, I'd be team unicorn on that um, as well. But so our next one going into more of a digital transformation um, would you rather work with a software that is very user friendly but lacks advanced features or a software that is feature packed but difficult to use. And Adam, we'll go to you first on this one. Um, I would rather use something that that feels natural. Um, you know, the, a natural fit is always a good thing. And so, for me, I would rather use something that was easy and simple mm -hmm. and got me what it is I needed quickly and simply, um, than have to go looking for it and spend extra time on that. What about you, Eric? Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd definitely go user friendly, less less features. Um, partly because you look at most organizations, they can't they can't get the value out of the simplest technologies as it is. So they, the last thing they need mm -hmm. is more complexity and more features. They just need to figure out how to use the ones they've got. And also uh, another data point I always look at, or not always, I've never been asked this question, so I don't know what I'm talking about or why I would say always. But as I think about it right at this moment, one thing I think about is some of the software reviews I do on YouTube, on my YouTube mm -hmm. channel, um, it's funny, the negative comments about whatever software I'm reviewing objectively, where I talk about the pros and cons, I, I'd say by far the number one sort of negative response I get on mm -hmm. those reviews is the user friendliness of the soft, whatever the software is. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a lot of times it's product X sucks because it's hard to use. I mean, it's not, it, rarely do I hear you know, the features are lacking or it can't do certain things. It's usually because it's hard to use. I think that's uh, something that the world craves more of is user friendliness. Absolutely. Very I think interesting. There's a, a differentiator here, though. I would rather use the user friendly software, but I would rather my company <laughs> <laughs> right. use something more feature rich. So uh, there's more behind the user friendly nature of, of what it is I see. Um, but, you know, maybe that's a bit selfish, but. 
So what uh, if everyone says that though? What if everyone in the company wants user friendliness, but they want complex or more features for the rest of the company that's that a, no one, no one's question. willing to accept? Uh, nobody's willing to accept the more complicated version. Um, then I think you got to go with user friendly. That's at, at the end of the day. Um, you know, we got a link to end users not only saying adoption is quicker, but adoption is is the key, right? It doesn't matter how many features you have if you aren't going to use them and you're going to do all of that nonsense in Excel anyway. So I would much rather have a user friendly software. Um, but if I could be in a position where my team was capable of understanding complex, feature rich, then let's go for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, definitely. And it depends in there, but I'm glad everyone's picking it aside. Um, so would you rather work with a software that is popular and widely used um, or a software that is new and innovated, but untested in the marketplace? Uh, my response would be new and innovative. Um, probably, I mean, mainly because if the more established vendors, oftentimes it, it, they're slower to change and they're, they're mm -hmm. less focused on whatever function it is. I guess my caveat to that response is assuming that this newer innovative technology is more focused on what I need, then I'd rather have that newer technology that's more focused on what I need versus a more established one that's perhaps trying to be everything to everyone or, mm -hmm. and or um, too rigid in its, in its approach. Because if I'm if I'm using technology as a competitive differentiator and a way to get ahead, then I'd rather have the, the newer, more innovative one and whatever technical deficiencies or functional deficiencies there are, um, you know, those are easier to overcome than a lack of fit or a lack of alignment with what I'm trying to do as a business. Interesting. I thought you were going to go the other, the other way, but um, Adam, what are you, what do you think about that one? I'm definitely going the other way. Um, you know, we <laughs> I don't know how many expert witness cases we've seen. It's like this is the first time anybody implemented yeah. this, and it's a complete catastrophe. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want to be a guinea pig. I, um, you know, it's a, a proven software package, I think, is uh, is a much smaller risk. And I think it's less on the technology's responsibility to be innovative at your company than it is your business's responsibility to be innovative. So um, if you put the innovation of your business on your business people, uh, then the technology just needs to support that. And if, if you get into the space where you are in a very niche industry that needs something very specific to be innovative, especially if your product is technology, that might sway the answer in the other direction. But for the most part, companies out there that are doing things that have been done for a long time or fairly well proven in a software package, that's, there's a lot to be said for that. And I, um, I'd hate to be the first person who implemented SAP S4 HANA. But today, you know, I'd be all right with that as long as you get it right, you know. So I'd hate to be the first person who implemented NetSuite. Uh, but today, it's a proven software package. It works out great. It can be innovative and proven at the same time. And I would rather go with proven. Absolutely. I like the comment. I like the comment that uh, someone on LinkedIn said, I can't see the name of the person, but uh, new and in innovative. That's why I bought it, thought ahead and bought a Betamax, <laughs> which is pretty funny. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, it's the old, before there was DVD, before there was VHS, there was something called Betamax, which is actually one of the pioneer, or it was kind of a pioneer high quality way of portable electronic video watching. And it didn't quite last beyond a, a sort of a flash in the pan timeline. <laughs> So uh, you may also remember HD DVD. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> or Blu-ray. No idea right? what you guys are talking about. No, I'm just jo joking. How about Blu-ray? That was another one. Yeah, that was a flop as well. Yeah. But um, this but LinkedIn user, yeah, right, it says it depends on the situation and what I'm trying to help the client implement. That's what Adam and Eric wish they could say. But unfortunately, I'm forcing them into yeah. um, picking an answer in this one. We're here with members of the third stage team talking about five years of lessons with our clients over the five years that we've been in business as a company. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. 
Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. You can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And uh, Kyler, you're leading us through a conversation with myself and others on the third stage team talking about some of our lessons over the last five years of helping clients through their digital transformations. Let's jump back into the conversation, Kyler. And this one's really going to just blow up the chat here because it's very controversial. Would you rather work with a software that is cloud-based or on-premise? Uh, cloud-based, for sure. I want to say it. What about you, Eric? I'd say both. <laughs> part cloud, part on-premise. I'd put the commodity stuff in the cloud, like financials and GL, AP, reporting, analytics, stuff like that. And then I would put some of my customer facing or product facing or competitive differentiating functions uh, on prem or at the very least it would be on prem but or, or in the cloud but uh, single tenant so i've got the ability to tailor it and customize it and that sort of thing so i, I would do sort of a hybrid hybrid there we go yeah um and my last this or that question here and then we'll get into those top five key lessons actually i want to pick on that you want to be <laughs> on the front ends of a technical and innovative so new technical and innovative software but you certainly can't let go of the on-premise <laughs> like <laughs> this seems co contradictory here eric well I'm, I'm I'm making a couple assumptions. One assumption is that the cloud stuff still isn't fully mature, right? In five years, I probably change this answer, 10 years, whatever it is. Um, but right now, there's so much that's still immature, some of those edge solutions. So I'm assuming, you know, in a perfect world, if those edge solutions were mature in the cloud. Unproven, right? What's that? That they're unproven, though, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing. If they're on-prem, they are proven. They've been around for longer. So you've got- But you uh, want the unproven innovative software. Oh man, that's true. That's why I'm going cloud too. That's why I'm hedging by yes. having some we'll cloud. Yes, he uh, <laughs> said his capacity of, of being able to be boxed in. He can't do that anymore. Exactly. I I had enough trouble with the last two questions where I had to yeah. choose one or the other. I had to yeah. somewhere be in the middle. <laughs> oh, my last one here is: Would you rather work with a client that is incredibly technically sophisticated, or a client that is more emotional intelligence? and OCM focused, organizational change management focused. So question there, because um, we have clients in all spheres of industries and businesses that are technical or non-technical. So I'm interested to hear what your preference would be if you could choose. Who's first? Not everybody. I, I, I have a strong there. reaction to this. I have a very clear, strong <laughs> reaction, which you probably already know. <laughs> But I'd, I'd say uh, emotionally intelligent, even if they know nothing about technology, I'd rather take that organization. Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes, I don't want to say ignorance is bliss, but when it comes to technology, some of the, the most successful transformations we've been through have been with organizations that are highly emotionally intelligent and they lack technical capabilities or technical skills. Um, but they have a way, those types of organizations have a way of not complicating things. They have a way of simplifying mm -hmm. and a way of cherry picking and being more selective and deliberate about technology versus the more technical companies are more likely to get convoluted and confused and overly complex from a technical perspective, which just creates more problems on the, the human and operational side. So for sure, the emotionally intelligent, low technology type of company. What about you, Adam? I'm going to strike a middle ground and I'm going to say I would rather work for a client that understands the value of what it is they're hiring people for and where it is their needs are. Um, you could be highly emotionally intelligent and have no idea about technology, but think you do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a disaster. Um, you could be technically inclined and, and be very educated in that, but know that you don't have the emotional uh, intelligence or the change management know-how. And that's a far better scenario. Um, so I would rather work with somebody that can be um, 
understanding of the big picture and the partnership involved um, and know where it is, be, that have a self-awareness. So maybe that's a backwards way, a way of backing into the emotionally intelligent side of things. I'm not necessarily as worried about the change management or the technical management as I am about somebody who knows what they need knows and knows where their gaps are so that I can help with that. Very true. Yeah. And a lot of um, a lot of people are agreeing with you here. Um, David on LinkedIn says EQ, you can um, teach tech easier than change behavior, which is so true. Um, and then adapting to change here we have they can be quicker in adapting any change versus technically competent. So a lot of a lot of similar um, reactions to the audience. And we do have one other question that I uh, I feel like I have to ask at this point. Beatles or Elvis? Would you rather listen to the Beatles for the rest of your life or Elvis for the rest of your life? Since we Beatles are for sure music focused here. What about Be you, Adam? Uh, that's a, I guess, I mean, it would have to be the Beatles <laughs> because they've got a whole lot more out there. Um, but I think if I had to commit to one particular uh, music background, there's a bit more of a, I like the story of Elvis much better. So um if it's just the music, it's got to be the Beatles. If it's the whole picture, it's Elvis. Hmm. Well, there we what go. About the song songwriting, though, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't beat John Lennon and Paul McCartney on the songwriting front. You, Elvis didn't write, write his own stuff. But you know what? Um, Elvis did perform as the, the things that he did quite well. You know? Yeah, he true. is the king of rock and roll. So it's true. But the oh, Beatles yeah. evolved more. You know, they they pushed the boundaries more. <laughs> They got weird in the seventies before they broke up. Didn't well, we all? that was that's true for everybody though. So yeah, that's, that's exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, um, good. Well, if, if you have the audience members any more, would you rather questions? Go ahead and pop them in the comments. Elvis is that. still alive. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Leave it to someone from the third stage team. I know, to, right? To, to call to that really out. Just disrupt. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> But if you have um, additional questions for Adam and Eric, because I pull them back on track here um, to talk about these top key lessons about digital transformation, go ahead and pop it in the comments wherever you're joining. I also encourage you to ask them questions in real time. As you see, we're pretty um, sophisticated and engaging with our audience, and which is the goal of all of these, um, these conversations. Um, so with that, let's get into kind of the five key lessons that we look at. Uh, so I, I want to kind of go back to the importance of technology agnostic and independent advice in the overall digital transformation area, just to kind of set the baseline for why do companies like third stage or third stage advisors, why are they so important to have that perspective and that dedication to business goals in the overall dynamic of a digital transformation? So with that, um, let's let's go to Adam first um, as well. What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> He's still thinking about Beatles and Elvis. I know, oh, right? really, really I should have never like, started with the game because now we can't know. <laughs> um, so I asked, what is the importance of independent and technology advice or situations in the digital transformation marketplace. Um, and it looks like probably one of our children interrupted him. So now we're going to go to Eric with, <laughs> with that question. We have a, a two and a four year old. So it's, it's a wild time at the Cheatham household. I like so. how he, he just went off camera and yeah, he was of, like, uh, no, nope. he's yeah. like, no, I, I don't like that question. Pass. <laughs> um, so I guess I have to answer it. Uh, yeah, you do. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, th I think the, you know, when I look at the industry and the, and the reason I wanted to start a company that was independent and tech agnostic is just because the the industry as a whole is the tech industry is so big and sophisticated and well designed to sell software. I mean, you've built not only software vendors, but a whole ecosystem of, of system integrators and consultants and industry analysts. They're all on the side of vendors. You know, vendors are mm -hmm. using their money and influence to to influence the market to adapt as much of their software as possible. And there's nothing wrong with the profit motive or capitalism, at least in my opinion, but it becomes a problem when you're a customer and you need someone to represent you and not the software vendors. It's just a, it's, it's a, not a level playing field or it hasn't been historically. And so having that independent agnostic advice to not only define what the best technology or technologies are for your organization, but just as importantly, how you implement that technology from an agnostic perspective, that's not, 
only focused on one vendor, but also not only focused on technology. Back to the EQ, you know, the emotional intelligence question, um, you need a technology agnostic advisor that isn't myopically focused on deploying technology. You need someone that can look at the overall program management, the program strategy, the organizational change and adoption and the business process reengineering, the, the integration and the data of multiple systems. All that stuff is stuff that's usually not done well by organizations or software vendors in their, their ecosystem. Absolutely you, well said. You know, to, to add on to that, the, the way that we think about digital transformation on the whole third stage is based on uh, not as much ERP as a single software package anymore, but uh, your digital enterprise operations as, a, as the goal of this, digitizing your operations at the enterprise level, right? So when you start thinking about it that way and th think about the software ecosystem, not just the one ERP that becomes a piece of the puzzle, there are so many other plugins that you need that are not going to come from one vendor anymore. They just don't. The ERP yeah. packages today are not as mature as they were uh, five, ten years ago because everybody's shifting to the cloud and this subscription-based platform. And so you end up having to plug things into each other, you end up having to manage a network of vendors towards the completion of um, a full transformation you mm -hmm. plug that network into your network as an organization this gets really complex really fast and so the the challenges that you see in those spaces are really oriented towards how do i manage all of these bits and pieces with the uh, with the ex the realistic expectation that it's not all going to come from one place so Absolutely. And, th and that kind of brings me into our first lesson, which is developing an enterprise digital strategy and the need for it to be across the business. A lot of times when we come into a remediation project or uh, a transformation that might be in trouble, a lot of what we hear is this was an IT project and didn't consider the other pieces of the business that it touched. So in moving to you, Eric, can you kind of define the importance of developing an enterprise strategy for digital transformation as opposed to just a compartmentalized strategy? Sure. Well, just as the Beatles are far superior to Elvis, as we've already established. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just kidding. It's funny, though, how the chat is still I know. coming back to that question. Like someone just commented about how Elvis has more albums than, uh, he does. than I, the Beatles. I, I, Leave it's, it to transformation folks to use data to say they've, they've right. researched this in the minutes that we've had it. So thank you for that that but, education. But it made me wonder, if, does anyone really want to talk about digital transformation? Or are they more interested in, in Beatles versus Elvis? But um, <laughs> I'd start now. I forgot your question. Sorry, I'm going to pull an Adam and say, can you repeat the question? Well, well no, I think it's important to, to, to focus in on this, where if you think about digital transformation, you know, the Beatles create a really dynamic team, right? Um, you need that in a lot of cases, but from an or from a, a digital transformation perspective, having a good strong leader that can really carry the weight starts to become the front end of it, which is why mm -hmm. Elvis is considered the king of rock and roll because he's a Ooh. leader in space and the Beatles are a group of folks doing great work, but didn't really rise to that level of title because you know, they couldn't handle each other. Well, you see, Adam, that's where you're wrong because <laughs> because you need a you need a uh, you need a team to make a transformation successful. You can't just have a king like Elvis. You need a team of people, um, which is what's great about John, uh, Paul, George, and Ringo. Is you know the Beatles aren't the Beatles without any one of them. Just like every organization isn't that organization without their key leaders and and people. That's true. But uh, and and I'd be willing to bet if we brought Elvis on here today, he would say that it's a you know the team is really what makes his success. So I think he would give True. credit to that. You know? so, so we can, we can agree on that. That's good. So we can agree. It seems necessary. Right. Yes. Yeah. There we go. Well, I really didn't see this conversation unfolding this way when I, you know, picked the game, but I'm really glad that we can find some key nuances and lessons, right. From Elvis versus the Beatles um, as well. And, I just look, I love how Seth is taking it a whole new sort of similar direction. Seth on LinkedIn is talking about wings. I love it. He's he's let's go down a, a another side <laughs> detour with Paul McCartney in wings. I like it. We've got Nirvana in here. We've got Journey in here. Um, so we've got a, a lot of music reference and and I should mention, or actually I'll let you mention, Eric, what is third stage named after? Yes. So um <laughs> 
Sorry, the chat. The chat's pretty funny today. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're doing a good job. Not a of for this conversation, <laughs> right, Kyler? We're still on track for that. I know. Yeah, I, I guess. But this this whole conversation is going off the rails pretty quick. But uh, I like it. Um, <laughs> uh, so the so the name third stage uh, is a two part meaning or two part metaphor or reference. One is a metaphor for a space launch. So um, third stage being a third stage boost that gets a rocket up to its ultimate height and speed. First and st second stages get it off the ground, up into space, but then the third stage is what gets you into orbit. And so we just use that as a metaphor for digital transformations. They're difficult. Uh, it's hard to find gravity and inertia. It's hard to get to that third stage of success, and there's a lot of risk along the way. So our job and our goal and our mission is to help clients uh, through that journey to get to the third stage. Uh, but I'd love to say that whole analogy or, or that whole metaphor was my idea. I actually stole it from the band Boston, whose third album was called Third Stage. And they sort of made that not a concept album, but they made a whole album named Third Stage that was uh, based on that same metaphor for the rocket launch. Although they were getting a little trying to get a little deeper and make it about the third stage of life and middle age life, which is right where I am as well. Um, so, uh, but it's really the space metaphor and the rock and roll connection that, uh, where, where the origin comes from. Yeah. So we are on brand, right. With our conversation here about, um, music well, as well. Totally applicable, right. Like the last thing you really want in transformation is have success and then have all of your people leave. You know, yeah. we don't want to break up the band. Right. Absolutely. We don't want point. to, we don't want to break up the band. We're here with members of the third stage team talking about five years of lessons with our clients over the five years that we've been in business as a company. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. When I wake up, well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you. Are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And uh, Kyler, you're leading us through a conversation with myself and others on the third stage team talking about some of our lessons over the last five years of helping clients through their digital transformations. Let's jump back into the conversation, Kyler. Our second lesson is embracing um, innovation. Uh, so we kind of talked about the importance of that innovation versus, versus the balance of having a really established system. So I want to talk a little bit about the strategies for fostering an innovation within an organization to make sure you're getting in front of things like the resistance to change or the fear of new emerging technologies. So Adam, can you talk a little bit about the importance of having that innovative mindset on your transformation core team? Yeah. So I think that the, the reasoning behind this is what you want to get after, right? <clears throat> what are we trying to do with a digital transformation? And we are trying to gain efficiencies and effectiveness and additional visibility and transparency and all of these great things into our business. And we're talking about becoming an, creating an innovative change. And that's the important part of the transformation. So if you don't respect the idea of innovation within this, you end up with, um, just recoding your old processes and paying more money for them. That's, mm -hmm. that's really the, the, the challenge there, right? And when you start to innovate your processes to fit that innovative technology, that's where you really start to strike a chord in how your business can change and adopt. And then you bring your people along with that, right? That's a key component as well. And, <clears throat> you know, I, either band that we're talking about, the Beatles versus Elvis, uh, both disruptive, 
right? That's mm -hmm. part of what created change in the music scene and in uh, around the world, really, uh, for both of them. That disruptive nature, that willingness to look towards the future is really a key component of a successful transformation and innovation is a key component of that. You can't tell me that you want to recode your green screen processes into a brand new system and do the same business. Uh, that's that's not what anybody asks for. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's why that's such a key uh, key challenge there. All shook up, see? Uh, <laughs> I had to bring that one up. <laughs> you guys are killing it this morning. Absolutely killing it in the comments here. And I promise I will get to some of your actual um, granular questions in here. Um, after I, I let Eric respond to um, the need for innovation on um, the ERP core team or digital transformation core team. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think there's a couple responses. I have a couple things that come to mind when you talk about innovation. One is that, first of all, just focusing on innovation as a whole and not just assuming that just because you're replacing technology means that therefore you're going to become more innovation, more innovative as an organization. Um, you, there's a lot more you have to do than just put the technology and tools in place. You have to change the culture. You have to change your processes. Mm -hmm. You have to change the way you think as an organization, which leads to a second point, which is you have to measure, you have to be measured about your, um, journey towards innovation. Too many organizations try to take too big of a leap and they try to cram too much change and innovation in too short of a time when perhaps they're a risk adverse, well-established, mm -hmm. mature organization that just isn't going to adapt to that level of innovation that quickly not to say you can't push the needle and nudge the needle that direction but typically the innovation and building that culture and building that mindset takes a lot longer than it takes to deploy technology and so you have to recognize and, and just sort of pace yourself in that journey and be realistic and self-aware of where you are as an organization mm -hmm. right now and if you're super risk adverse you have highly tenured staff you're a company that's been around for 200 years just recognize that and you're not going to change that fact, but that doesn't mean that you necessarily need to jump off the deep end and just, you know, go all in on a big, massive transformation that doesn't align with, you know, what you're capable of, of adapting in the, in the short term. So I think it's just a, a matter of looking to the future, but also being realistic about where you are and understanding how big of a jump you're taking and, and you know, planning and executing accordingly. Yeah. Very similar to what we're getting in the con comments, Kassan on LinkedIn said, innovate process, educate people, own technology change and adaption, um, which is which is so important. And I think it brings us to our, um, our, our third lesson, which is a culture of readiness. So let's talk a little bit more about the importance of assessing the readiness or the current state of the organization, because we see a lot of really well-intentioned clients come to us saying, we want to do A, B, and C. However, sometimes we have to be sort of that litmus test and that reminder that there's only so much you can accomplish with the current state that you have. Um, and sometimes it's better on that phased approach. So Eric, can you answer that for us? What's the importance of understanding your current state and your readiness to actually undergo a big change like a digital transformation? <laughs> Well, I think it's hugely important, and it's probably the most underrated um, preparation step that mm -hmm. organizations fail to to look at simply because they, again, they, they focus on, similar to my answer about innovation, they focus so much on the technology and all the great cool stuff that technology can do, and they want to take these quantum leap, leapfrog sort of uh, advances in their business, um, which is a great vision to have, but then they fail on recognizing what the execution is going to take. They go talk to a software vendor who says, yep, we could deploy this whole tool set that's going to make you so innovative and, and create this culture of readiness. You know, we can deploy it in 18 months, and which they probably can. I rarely question a, a technical vendor's ability to implement in a certain amount of time, but that's usually not the problem or the bottleneck. The problem or the bottleneck is creating that culture and being ready as an organization and moving the needle of humans and the operations to keep up with the advances in technology. And um, one thing I was talking to about with one of our other colleagues here in the office yesterday, who's going to be on this uh, podcast here in a couple of weeks is we're talking about that, that growing divide between technology and humans and how mm -hmm. technology is changing exponentially faster than the ability of humans. And that gap, as that gap gets wider, the risk profile and the, the failed uh, expectations or, or the, um, the letdown that comes along with that mm -hmm. becomes greater because organizations simply can't keep up with technology. So you have to sort of 
just accept it for what it is. And again, try to move the needle in that direction, get your organization ready, move the organization along, but recognize that your, your technology advances don't matter if your people in the operations can't keep up with it. For yeah. sure. Yeah. And I got to bring this one up. So Adam has some context. So we're going to football now. Um, so yeah, Brett Favre, the father, the farther you throw down the, the field, the more likely it is to get intercepted. Um, and we're talking American football here. We don't need to get in the the argument about what is football, if, unless we want to, because we're just going you all know, over the place. But what's your Brett reaction Favre to that? Record for touchdowns and interceptions. So let's, let's <laughs> yes. compare to that. Um, but, I, um, you know, it's, uh, at the end of the day, I think you got to focus on what's realistic. Um, if you got a shot at it, yeah, business is about taking chances. It's everything you do in business from a day-to-day perspective is is a risk in and of itself right um some of them are lower risks some of them are higher risks like five yards versus 60 but at the same time sometimes you got to go for it sometimes you got to know where your limits are right um you know if you ask me to throw a football down the field um i'd be surprised if anybody caught it (laughs) (laughs) so there's also that but understanding who you are, and this kind of goes back to that earlier question on EQ versus technical capability, you got to know what it is your capacity for change is and how big of a change we're making, right? Uh, we got some folks that are in, uh, moving from um, a semi-modern ERP to a modern ERP, ECC6 to S4 HANA or EBS to ERP Cloud or um, you know an, an older version of M4 to a newer version of M4. They're all moving from something that was implemented in the early 2000s to something that was designed to be implemented now. And then there are folks who are literally telling us, we have been on this software since 1980. Um, that change is going to be more significant. And so mm-hmm. the, the the scope and the magnitude of that change is a key component of it, right? How far are we going? And then what are our people's capacity for change? Um, folks that tend to change more regularly tend to be a little bit more caught up. So the farther behind you are, that's usually an indicator that you're also going to struggle with the ability to capture that change. So that's, that's where I think about readiness to get, to get back to that conversation, which is knowing who you are and what you're working with. How far are we going? What does our future state look like? Um, not everybody out there needs to be on the bleeding edge of technology. And there are more traditional industries that are going to be more conservative in, in where it is they're going to go. So they don't no, they don't want to be on the cloud. They don't want to be on the front end of it. And that's OK. That moves the baseline of change back a little bit, makes it maybe more attainable. So how much can change can we consume at once? And then your plan should realize that. Right. Um, we want to take this in. Di- um, in digestible bites um, as opposed to all at once. So that's the way I think about readiness and understanding where it is you're coming from, where it is you're going and how it is you're going to be able to get there. What tools you have, those types Absolutely. of things. Yeah, those incremental steps, certainly. Um, that's that's definitely important to kind of understand. Um, so, so I'm still on the Brett Favre thing. I have to come back to that for a second because I have an important uh, analogy here. So, so, so we're based. So, third stage as a company is based in Denver. Our, our global headquarters is based in Denver, and that's where um, I am today. And you guys are close to Denver as well. Um, but the reason I bring up Denver is because Brett Favre uh, or, or Denver Broncos, the first Super Bowl they won was against Brett Favre. And if you look at the stats of that game, I mean, Brett Favre did the Brett Favre stuff. He had more passes. He had more yards. John Elway from the Denver Broncos did not have a great game, um, but he made the critical plays where he needed to. He made the short passes. The, you know, he had one play that was a critical first down where he ran the ball himself for five yards, which he never did. That wasn't his style. And he got hit really hard. He helicoptered up in the air and hit the ground. And it's like a classic, uh, one of the greatest plays in Denver Broncos history. But that play was largely attributed to why the Broncos won. Now, the reason I'm bringing this all up and tying it back to digital transformation is it was the Broncos won with a really measured strategic approach that was not focused on flashy, long passes. It was focused on short passes. It was focused on running the ball with Terrell Davis, and it just wore down the the Bronc- or the uh, Packers, the Green Bay Packers, which is who Brett Favre played for. It wore down their defense over time, and, and the Denver Broncos were smaller. They weren't favored. They were the underdogs. But I, it, to me, that's a good analogy for 
digital transformations. I mean, you don't have to take the long, deep pass and mm-hmm. hope that someone catches it. You can. It's usually more effective, and you have a higher likelihood of success to take those smaller, measured um, approaches or steps in your mm-hmm. in your transformation. So I'm I'm trying really hard. It might be a stretch. I'm trying really hard to bring the analogy full circle back to uh, digital transformation here. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah. poke a big hole in that and ask how many attempts <laughs> did it take? Uh, how many failed shots at this did John Elway have before he got it right? Uh, three, he lost three. I think he lost three times before he won, but that's another important lesson is because organizations we work with clients that we work with, the most successful ones are the ones that have failed in the past. The ones that are the highest risk and the hardest ones to work with are the ones that have never, they've never been through a transformation and, or they've never failed in a transformation. Then they get this false sense of confidence. They have blind spots. So I actually, uh, I think the reason John away won that Super Bowl is because he had lost three times and because he was older and wiser, wasn't as athletic and youthful as he was back in their first Super Bowls, but he ends up winning as an old dude. So, yeah, that's, there you that's go. Point. Well, that's, that's important to understand the power of failure, right? Um, which kind of brings me to our last lesson, which is investing in the right technology. Cause a lot of times we see that failure stem from having a mismatch in selecting the technology for your organization, which can be a very complex undertaking because of the saturation in the marketplace, because of the agendas of vendors when they come in and do demos, which is something, you know, we help kind of remediate. We're here with members of the third stage team talking about five years of lessons with our clients over the five years that we've been in business as a company. We've got a lot more to cover. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Transformation Ground Control. A man decides after 70 years that what he goes there for. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 117. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And uh, Kyler, you're leading us through a conversation with myself and others on the third stage team talking about some of our lessons over the last five years of helping clients through their digital transformations. Let's jump back into the conversation, Kyler. Can you guys talk about why it's so important to select the right technology for your organization, whether that is a core ERP or a best of breed application solution, um, those types of things. So Adam, let's start with you on that one. Yeah. So a moment ago, we talked about how big of a change is it and what's your capacity for accepting that change, right? Uh, The end point, uh, you know, the front end of that future state is going to be partially based on your technology. Um, your technology is going to be part of your future state. They're going to be bound together. That's the idea here, right? So if you take a technology that's going to fit your business needs, your level of change is smaller. But if you take something that's a poor fit, um, the level of change is more significant, more complex, right? You got to start thinking about, am I changing software or am I changing my processes? And the more often you have to ask that question, the more complicated things get, get. And it's not a net ad. It's not just one more thing and one more. Every one more thing is an exponential increase for your complexity um, uh, in the complexity of the change that you're, you're seeking. And so you're creating with a poor software fit, you're creating a bigger gap between where you are today and your future state from a perspective of how much change are we going to go through And not only are you increasing the size of that gap, you're also adding a whole lot of obscurity to it. And how it is, do we figure this out? It creates Mm -hmm. dependencies on your system integrators, which is never a good thing from a perspective of how do we solve these problems? You start to create a knee-jerk reaction, which is just put it back the way it was. 
um, which is an indicator of not accepting change and reverting to the old ways. Is there's the the better the software fit and the better the technology strategy and the digital roadmap that you have based on your business needs and objectives, the more you can control the scope of that change. And uh, that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well said. What's your reaction to that, Eric? That's hard to follow. That was really yeah. well said. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I kept thinking of stuff that I wanted to add and then you would, uh, you would go ahead and cover it. So you stole all my thunder, Adam. I've got nothing. Uh -huh. um, no, I would just say that, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to force a square peg into a round hole. And, and mm -hmm. while a moment ago I did say technology um, is usually the least of the concerns, uh, it, it can be a concern though, if you don't have the right fit of technology. And I think this is especially true when you start to look at some of the unique aspects of your business. And when I say unique aspects of your business, I don't mean unique because you just refuse to change and it's just the way you've always done it. I mean, because it's a competitive differentiator, it's part of your industry, it's sort of a customer requirement, something you need to be successful and to, to, you know, to beat your peers or to be better than your peers in the industry. So when you get to those areas, that's where you're more likely not to have a fit. And that's where you're more at risk of force fitting technology in places where it shouldn't be. And when I say technology, I don't, I don't mean that no technology would fit, but, but a vendor, a, vendor a may not fit into that need. And so you have to be creative and, and open to looking at what are our options. We could go with the best of breed model. We could custom develop a solution that we own that gives us that competitive differentiator um, and satisfies our needs better than an off the shelf system. Those are the sorts of trade-offs and decisions you need to make to make sure that you're not just assuming that one size fits all and that one technology can handle all of, your, all of your needs. Absolutely. And we got an interesting comment here that I want to bring up, which I should have asked in our, would you rather, I can't believe I missed this one. Would you rather have a core ERP system or a best of breed approach? Um, and so this is kind of answering that. Don't underestimate the level of techni technical acumen you will need to, in order to maintain a hybrid architecture that results from a best of breed approach. And that's something we talk a lot about in interoperability, which is part of kind of our overall digital strategy, which we talked about in lesson one. Um, and just real quick before I let Adam and Eric respond to that comment, uh, we do have a variety of best of breed versus ERP um, content on not only our YouTube channel, but Eric's YouTube channel. And he did a recent um, talk on it on our ground control podcast, which this uh, overall will be featured in as well. So if you haven't seen any of those, definitely hop over to his channel and you can you can check them out there. But what's your thoughts on kind of that best of breed versus core ERP, which is a main thought track in the industry right now? Well, uh, my opinion on that is, uh, you know, it depends, first of all, but more often than not, best of breed or some sort of limited best of breed is going to be um, more feasible for most organizations, unless you're a younger, smaller, um, more, I hate to say generic, but just more of a common basic organization that doesn't have very complex needs in its system. I actually have a, a YouTube video that's coming out next week on my YouTube channel. In fact, if you look real carefully behind me there you can see i don't know if you can see the whiteboard there i'll turn it oh, just a little yeah. bit there Ooh, a little so, behind the scenes yeah there. this is what's left over from that video so you get to see, that's just like a sneak preview of a video that's Ooh. not out yet but if you want to see uh you know what the hell all that means uh you you can see on my youtube channel in a couple of weeks i talk about the pros and cons of single erp system versus versus best of breed and whatnot so uh, but I think in general best of, single erp is sort of like that utopia back to the unicorns and dragons mm -hmm. Uh, single ARP is like the unicorns and dragons view of the world. You, you think mm -hmm. it exists, but really it doesn't. It'd be cool if it did, but yeah. single ARP is not realistic for most organizations. Software vendors will, will absolutely disagree with me on that. And they will fight me to the end on that point, but I strongly believe it. And because I'm not trying to sell you software, um, but you can have a core single mm -hmm. ERP system, but then you're inevitably probably going to need some sort of best of breed bolt-ons and applications to meet all the complex requirements, especially if you're a larger, global, more complex organization. Well, I think that that goes to the just the state of the market right now, too, right? Ten years ago, um, when it's Oracle EBS versus SAP ECC6, I think that answer is different. You know, the, you, can, you could get it all in one box. The technology has evolved since then to not only 
um, add more functionality to the availability in the market. But those software platforms are changing. So you can you more or less can't buy more EBS or ECC6 anymore. You got to go ERP cloud or S4 HANA or the whole slew of all of these other things that are moving to cloud. Those are packages that had 30 plus years of development behind them in, in the real live world and in the market to grow to that level of completion and maturity. And I mean, what S4 HANA might be 15 years old tops at this point and that's still and it's still kind of in a um in an infancy stage in many ways right so there's just not that level of time that's been devoted to growing that software package so and this applies not just to sap all of them um that suite there's a different argument for because they've been in that space quite a lot longer um so their spread is a little bit more a little bit wider but at the end of the day um there's there are not running a lot of multi-billion dollar companies. So there's there's that side of it. The, the maturity in software creates holes today. And those mm -hmm. holes are filled by other best of breed niche packages that are important too. And what will happen is the, the big guys will buy them all up and they'll put them in their software systems. And in tw uh, another 10 years, this conversation might be quite different uh, just because of the evolution of software in and of itself. So I I think that's a key component of it where you just don't get all of the core functionality that you used to because it doesn't exist anymore um, because it's been innovative into innovated into a cloud environment. And that's a part of the challenge. So you got to those functions are still necessary. Um, somebody's doing them, but it's not the big box ERPs anymore. It's a little bit more of the um, the add ons and the, the more niche based smaller software packages. So that's how yeah. I see it. Yeah, absolutely. And and on that note, I want to turn to our audience for some questions here in our last couple of minutes, because this is an interesting question on data quality and that overall interoperability, which is sharing all of your data and actually having a full visibility across the enterprise, which is the importance of a full enterprise digital strategy. Um, and data quality is something that we see a lot of clients um, struggle with. So interested to hear your thoughts on on this one and eric we'll start with you well i think you know data quality is one of those things that i always thought was overrated you know 10 years ago 15 years ago if you would have asked me i, I thought data migration was was again getting too myopically focused on the technical aspects of an implementation but i think nowadays um regardless of whether i was right or wrong back then I think nowadays I was, I'm definitely wrong when it comes to that. You definitely need to focus on data quality, partly because so much of the value of technology is increasingly becoming about business intelligence and predictive analytics and artificial intelligence, all these really cool technologies that can and have the potential to transform a business, but they can't without having good data and, and a good handle yeah. on your data. So I think more and more organizations need to treat data as, as an asset. You know, Maybe it's not on your balance sheet, but it is something that maybe it should be because that data is really a core competitive advantage or can be of organizations that manage it well. Absolutely. And what's well, your thoughts, Adam? I think for me, it's data is not going to be the reason that your transformation was successful, but it can very much be the reason that it wasn't. <laughs> so you have to get it right. Um, you know, it's um, just the same way as um, the oil in your car isn't what's going to drive it. Um, but if you don't take care of it, um, it, you, it will ruin your car. So that's, that's how I generally think about the data side of it is that it is critically important. It's, um, and if it becomes your critical path in your implementation, you're in a bad spot. Um, so getting ahead of it and having it done well is important, but um, it's more of a, you have to do that right and get all of the other things right. It won't be the reason that you, that you go live successfully. Um, it will be a part of that. It's sort of like the George Harrison of the Beatles. You know, you've got John and Paul, <laughs> which everyone talks about, but George Harrison, without George Harrison and the guitar and the cool songs that he wrote, the Beatles wouldn't be the Beatles. And so you kind of need that, that piece of it. Uh, you, you have to have all those pieces and data is, is like that. That's, that's a bit of a stretch, I'll admit, but there you go. George Harrison and data. There you go. Wow. Way to like really put a bow on that and bring it back to. <laughs> I'm trying to, hard. Yeah. 
Right. Absolutely. Oh, we have Star Trek has entered the chat. We're not even going to start on that, that overall Star Trek versus Star Wars. But, um, but in, in kind of, you know, uh, rounding out this conversation, uh, we have a, a big milestone here with our fifth year anniversary, and we wouldn't have all of that great content to share without our wonderful audience and our engaging community. All right. Thank you, Kyler, for leading that conversation. And thank you to our team for being part of it. And uh, thank you to our entire team, including the 70 plus people that were not on this discussion here today um, for being part of the team and helping us get to where we are as an organization. And certainly thank you to the hundreds of clients that have trusted us to help them through their digital transformation journeys. And if you'd like to become one of those clients, uh, obviously feel free to reach out. You can reach out to me or Kyler. Um, You can reach out to us on uh, LinkedIn or we'll include our contact information below as well. Um, So we look forward to seeing what the next five years bring. A lot has changed in five years. It's continuing to accelerate in the pace of change. And uh, digital transformations will look uh, surely a lot more different in five years from now. So we'll be curious to see where where this all takes us. And we're just glad to be a part of it. So thank you all for listening here today. Thank you for being part of the podcast and part of this global digital transformation community. Uh, Please feel free to share this podcast with others, colleagues or friends that you think might be interested in this content. We'd love to get the word out to more people and continue to grow the audience here and continue to bring in more people into this community. So thank you for uh, sharing this in advance and be sure to leave us a review too, if you don't mind, especially if you're listening on audio podcast platforms, please leave us a review there. And if you're watching it on one of the many platforms, please give us a like and subscribe to the channel as well. So hope uh, you all have a great day. We'll look forward to seeing you next week on Transformation Ground Control. Take care. Today in episode number 100 and what is it? I forgot what it is. 17. 17. 17, yeah. I was going to go with 16, but I was like, it doesn't seem right, but I'm not sure. Tyler Kohler. I almost said Koiler. Killer. Koiler. (laughs) Hopefully that was... Is that all right? It'll be good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fine. Yeah. That's It's authentic. That's why people like this podcast. So Take two. Cut. Take two. Cassie can use AI to... Yeah. Tweet my voice on that, make it make Absolutely. it sound right. And can you give me a British accent too while you're at it, Cassie? Just so yeah. I sound a little more. Cassie loves when I say "cut," like I'm a, like I'm oh, yeah. directing and editing Absolutely. and stuff. I say that when in our other studio, and the guys always like, "So what are you doing?" I'm like, "I don't really know." I'm <laughs> just <laughs> talking to Cassie, and she's not even here. So yeah, henceforth I shall have a British accent because <laughs> my my real one's terrible, but AI can handle it. And action. <laughs> just kidding. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 100. Uh, wow. Third time's a charm. <laughs>